Big Tech's ordinance has everything from complete firearms to OEM and aftermarket parts. If you're looking to put together your first AR-15, they have everything from those parts that you need to the tools that are going to be essential. If you're looking for suppressors, night vision, handheld lights, weapon lights, sights or optics, you name it, Big Tech's has it all. Not only that, they're offering all those brands that we like. Go visit them at BigTechsOrdinance.com. Overwatch Precision is a team of civilians and combat veterans based in Phoenix, Arizona, that employ industry-leading production methods, coatings, and materials in their striker-fired polymer-framed pistol trigger systems. With an internal engineering team focused on thoughtful design, Overwatch's flat-faced and curved triggers safely deliver a mechanical advantage to your carry or duty Glock, Walther, CZ, P10, and Smith & Wesson MMP 2.0 with improved function and increased accuracy. See more at overwatchprecision.com. Filster makes awesome holsters. But not only that, they also happen to be one of those companies that are trendsetters. A lot of their designs are emulated by other companies. Not only does Filstered make those holsters, but they also provide concealment systems like the Enigma, the Flex. They also have a lot of solutions when it comes to concealment solutions for medical. If you need to have a concealment first aid kit, they happen to sell them. Check them out at filsterholster.com. Are you a professional looking for a reliable and high-quality rifle suppressor? Look no further than Primary Arms Government, whether you're equipping a team or shopping for your personal rifle. Primary Arms Government offers a complete selection of field-proven suppressors with options to fit any rifle and any budget. They work directly with the industry's leading brands to secure the best prices and available inventory, and their expert staff is always available to answer any questions you may have. Don't compromise on the safety and effectiveness of your equipment. Choose Primary Arms Government for all your suppressor needs. Visit them online today at Primary primaryarms.com slash government. Walther is the performance leader in the firearms industry, renowned throughout the world for its innovation since Carl Walther and his son Fritz created the first blowback semi-automatic pistol in 1908. Today, the innovative spirit builds off the invention of the concealed carry gun with the PPK series by creating the PPQ, PPS, and the Q5 match steel frame series. Military, police, and other government security groups in every country of the world have relied on the high-quality craftsmanship and rugged durability of Walther products. Walther continues its long tradition of technical expertise and innovation in the design and production of firearms. For more information, visit WalterArms.com. Hey everyone, Matt Lanford here with Primary and Secondary. Welcome to Modcast. Today's episode is 347. We're going to be talking about VCQB, Vehicle Close Quarters Combat. We have Will Petty here who put the program together. We have me and two others who have attended the course. Um, let's see here. It was, I can't even think, two weeks ago that we took the class? Yeah, two weeks ago. Um, today is July 6, 2023. Kind of excited about this discussion. Uh, Will's been on a long time ago. As a matter of fact, we were talking about it. He doesn't even remember. It's okay. Yeah, it was a long time ago. Um, this specific discussion, though, we're going to talk about uh, the the foundation of VCQB, why it might be something that would be of interest to you. Uh, also, it's applicability. Uh, we're also going to talk about class structure. Um, there's a lot of information out there and it's in, in the position I'm in, I enjoy being able to help people. I enjoy helping people understand stuff. And if I can help facilitate better understanding of something that's misunderstood, I'm going to jump all over that and try to assist any way I can. Um, as you're listening to this, we may have some panel changes. Um, keep in mind this though, we're about to do intros. Make sure you're supporting those sources that you have found to be beneficial. If you like what these guys are saying, you might want to find them on social media. Um, I, I don't know about Andy, but I know Jared has a, has a side gig and definitely Will has a side gig. Um, these guys are going to be sharing. What, what I was that? A side gig. Okay, fine. But um, Andy is the side gig. And we, Andy's Jared's side. No, and we link to uh, OnlyFans on here? Yes. <laughs> Perfect. So yeah, pay attention to what these guys have to say. If you like what they said, find them on social media. Um, social media clicks, views, all that kind of stuff. That's currency nowadays, unfortunately. And so your support is greatly appreciated. 
especially when it comes to anything gun content. So primary and secondary is Instagram account has been limited now. Yay. It was only a matter of time. Um, views, clicks, shares, subscriptions are helpful. So it, again, if you like what these guys had to say, find them on social media. If you like what, if they share something that is especially helpful to you, share it. Help others see where, how this is a beneficial uh, resource for you. Same with everything primary and secondary, where this is going to be a fairly short episode. It's not going to be seven hours, six though. Um, since we're just starting, make sure you're hitting the like button because now's the time. And th yeah, this is going to be available both audio and video for people that don't know. There are people that just watch YouTube. This is, a, this is going to be available on um, like iTunes and all those types of places. And if you're just listening on audio, it is on YouTube. So if you want to see what these guys look like, if you want to see some signs behind specific people that are on the panel about living and laughing and loving. <laughs> My background's in law enforcement, been doing the cop thing since last century. Started as a reserve officer, went to corrections. Uh, through corrections, I, I met a lot of interesting people, especially the clientele, but I also got a feel for the clientele I would be dealing with in the future. Um, that was a great opportunity to learn how to communicate with people, how to read people to a point, but also to realize all the people I'm dealing with aren't all horrible, bad people. A lot of them just made some bad decisions. From there, went uh, did patrol. That's where I'm at now, working on the street, driving, driving in a vehicle all day, 10 hours a day, uh, four days a week. To me, VCQB made a lot of sense. I heard a lot of interesting information about it. And I thought, you know what? This specific topic to me, considering my background and the background of, of, of training I've received through the academy and ongoing is minimal when it comes to this specific topic. I want to see, I want to see more for myself. I want to see if there's more to it. And that's what I did. So I'm going to stop talking. I'll let these guys start giving their backgrounds and what initially brought them into going to this class a couple of weeks ago. Andy. Uh, my name is Andy uh, and I work for the local sheriff's office here. Uh, I, I, I can't, I don't know. Like I've always wondered, like, do I say where I work? I don't. I can look it up and see. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I work at the, uh, the local sheriff's office, and right now I am a I work in our firearms training unit, and so I've been working there full time for about seven years. It was like seven years in June, so I've been a consumer of like anything firearms or training for many years, and I've been able to apply that in this position, and. Uh, that's me. Well, and what brought you to VCQB? Oh, and also, this isn't the first time you took it. Oh, yes. This is my second time that I, I had taken it. Um, I knew of Will. I knew of Centrifuge. Uh, I knew of VCQB, mostly just through, like, social media. But when I would see what the, that Will was teaching uh, or what was going on, if you – listen in my opinion if you listen to what they're saying and how it applies to law enforcement it's almost like a no-brainer like oh of course that that makes total sense how come i wasn't told this a long time ago um and then i decided you know we need to figure out how to host uh centrifuge and uh it was hosted at our range i went as a student the first time and the second time uh, i was able to like kind of be the host That and makes sense. and you've loved it ever since. I loved it ever since. And uh, one thing I, I, I like to tell people is it kind of doesn't necessarily matter like who it was that delivered this, in my opinion, awesome curriculum. It's just, you know, Will got it. He's delivered it to us. If it was anyone else, Joe Schmo, I'd be saying, you know, we got to host Joe Schmo. But we, I like Will too. Well, there's no guarantee that Joe Schmo would be Asian, so there's that. That's true. You're rolling the dice with a name like Joe Schmo. <laughs> For sure. My turn? I don't know. Andy, do you have more, or do you, do you just want to stop talking now? I, I, uh, I'm i a really good listener. <laughs> okay, I know how that is. <laughs> Jared? Uh, I'll make this quick. Uh, my name's to. Jared. I started at... Uh, 
about nine years ago uh, in the cop world. I worked for three years in a um, medium-sized department here in Utah. It had about 50 officers there. Uh, I worked there for three years, wanted to do more, wanted a bigger agency. So I transferred and lateraled over to one of the larger uh, agencies in the state uh, that has about three to 400 people there. Uh, I've been there for five years now on patrol. I recently got a detective position and I'm, I've been enjoying the lazy life for about uh, seven or eight months now. And it's great having a normal life and being able to make my own schedule is wonderful. Um, I also do a number of firearm. Firearms are kind of my thing. I like guns and I shoot a lot. I run the Utah Peace Officer Association uh, matches. We do a annual handgun championship and an annual multi-gun championship. That's actually the largest police officer match in the nation from what I'm aware of. I know there used to be some NRA matches out east that could compare to them, but as far as I know, um, our matches are actually the largest in the nation. We last This last handgun match, we had 250 guys sign up for it, and we had over 70 different agencies participate, local, federal. The guys are flying in and participating in it. We give away about forty to $50,000 worth of equipment and gear that gets donated to us by sponsors. And yeah, so I, I run that. Um, I also win <laughs> that. Uh, and so I, I compete quite a bit in USPSA and I used to do UML three gun, but that's kind of died off. Uh, I'm a, a class, uh, in carry optics limited and, uh, open, but I always shoot minor. And so I, if you guys know what I'm talking about, that's hard. Typically I'm in about the. I shoot with most of the M class guys, the masters, and I'm ranked as a pro in UML. And I got a second place in a nationals with UML once overall, not just my division. So that was, I, I shoot a lot. Uh, I also run my own little training company on the side called waypoint training. I just started it this year. And basically my goal there is to help uh, local cops get better. Uh, so I, I made a couple classes that are, addressing the deficiencies I see in the mandatory painting training by post. And so I'm trying to help fill in some gaps. And so if you're here local in Utah, I do classes and they're very, very reasonably ply price because I'm not, I'm not trying to make a ton of money here. I'm just trying to mainly just build stuff and get the local guys better. And that's what I've been doing for about six years now with the UPOA matches. And now I'm building it out into my own little training curriculum. Uh, from there, it's kind of branched out. And now I, I would argue I'm probably one of the lead firearm um, guys for the state with uh, law enforcement wise. So I help out at post. I help out like I have, I talk to, and get phone calls from guys all over the state about gun questions. And I help them out. And I'm just, that's what I'm trying to do is just trying to get Utah law enforcement better because it is not because they're great. Not. It's not great. And so we're working on making it better and we're working on trying to get systematic change and getting more people involved. And my, my big thing is basically I'm trying to build a bridge between uh, the cop world and the competition shooting world and trying to help cops understand the uh, benefits that you can gain in competing and actually finding about how small a fish you are in a, instead of just training with your 20 guys at your department and being the biggest swing and dick there. And then you go to a, match and you find out that you you suck so my goal is just to try to get everybody better and that's that's what i'm doing and i've taken will's class uh actually three times now a uh, big shout out to the old school reactive gunworks i was able to go uh take those two classes that andrew hosted uh he's an absolute stud i love that guy and i was able to take will's class twice i think it was the first time he came it was his normal and then the second time it was an accelerated class. So we got to do all sorts of fun stuff. And, uh, 
then this most recent one was I took the instructor level class and had fun there. Lots of learning. And a side note, the two of you also happen to be part of the governor's 20. How would you yeah. explain what that is to people that don't know what that is? So the governor's 20 is a the, basically the top 20 law enforcement shooters in the state of Utah. Um, they take the law enforcement matches and compile them and basically score them. And it's this percentage stuff. And basically the top shooters get to be on the governor's 20. We get to have a nice little banquet. The governor shows up, says, good job, gives us head, head pats. And we get to leave. It's a, it's a fun award to get. And I, I like, I like getting shiny things because at heart, I'm just a crow slowly collecting as many coins and patches and random things I can. I'm just glad you acknowledged that. Says the guy with a pegboard behind him. It's, it's green screen. <laughs> cool. Yeah. And then I have two buddies up here that are part of the 20 as well. I am surrounded by good influences. It's really nice. And I guess we'll talk to Will now. All right. Uh, <laughs> I uh, yeah, started 20 years ago, 2003. Actually, this is uh, this year is my 20th um, in LE. And in that um, in that time, I have done, man, just about everything, right? So patrol, quite a bit of patrol. Um, worked uh, at the range, ERT, firearms instructor. Um, worked at the academy, ran various academy programs, ended up becoming the lead on several, uh, was an academy coordinator um and am still in training so yeah and then along the way wrote material uh to address some issues that we were seeing to resolve you know common common trends common trends for my guys um that would eventually morph into what we now know as centerfuge training and you do have a set uh you do have set staff for centerfuge right yeah. Chase yeah. So there's, Blake. there's, uh, yep. Chase and Blake and I are, are full time. We've got about nine part time, uh, fellows that are, that are pretty busy. We're looking to bring another full time person on next year. And, uh, we have two admin ladies. Um, and we're, you know, we're, we're very fortunate to be, to be busy. Um, and so we're, we, we don't take that for granted for sure. So, yeah. yeah. So basically you were looking over trends and determined there's, there's a need here. When I, when I went through the academy, the, the extent of my training, it was felony stops and we're all doing it from the V. Done. Right. Let's do a couple right. reps. Good job. Yeah. So one of the things that, you know, we have built or one of the, the key components of, of Centrifuge as a company was to take a more um, systematic approach to law enforcement training. So we look at massive data sets. And then from that, we identify trends that are that are affecting our guys. Um, from that, we build drills to address these trends, break those drills down further into key skill sets, ensure the guys have a cognitive understanding as to, to what's going on. So when we look at the national data right now, 60% of all law enforcement engagements occur in or around a car. Um, so guys actually have a higher probability of being involved in a shooting um, in or around a vehicle from a law enforcement capacity than any other environment. The other 40% are broken down into open open air or inside structures. Um, and then when you look at the disparity between what guys are getting in, in terms of formalized training in or around vehicles, um, it just like, like you said, your, your experience is not an anomaly. Your experience is, is, is consistent across the board. It's, Hey, we're going to give you a, you know, a day or two on seven step approach traffic stops. We're going to give you a day or maybe half a day on, on high risk stops. And, and then, um, uh, you know, you're going to figure out the rest, right? So this, uh, the, the vehicle CQB program, uh, the material that, that, that I wrote was simply to address issues that, that my guys were facing. Um, and then from there start to, uh, you know, it's just a rabbit hole, right? So obviously in its infancy stage was very, uh, very immature and then um, started to, you know, grew and evolved to tackle uh, vehicle takedowns or pins, you know, through our bid program, high risk stops, um, you know, really systematically looking at um, traffic stops and best, best practices and things like that. So it, um, 
the goal was to branch away from how law enforcement is traditionally derived um, hypothesis or material in that, uh, you know, a guy would get involved in a shooting or two and then you know, become a firearms instructor or do SWAT, whatever, work at the academy. And then the and then all of his uh, all of his material that he pushes out going forward is is built off of the myopic view of like, hey, this this one time I right. So it's a very it's a very interesting law enforcement is very stuck in this like survivor bias. Like, hey, it, it worked for me and I made it out. So this is what we're going to continue to do. Um, but there's a better way to build a mousetrap. And when we look at the numbers specifically to law enforcement deaths and or injuries in and around cars, like we're not nationally doing a great job. Um, and so. Uh, that is consistent with, you know, the lack of, of training and exposure that guys are getting um, in a in-service or academy setting. So, yeah. So vehicle CQB is, is just exactly that. It's just to try to address like consistent stateside law enforcement trends that we're seeing. So, And one of the things that these guys pointed out also was having been through the class before, you brought up going from immaturity of the course of the coursework to a more established program how it's still evolved. And the, these guys have mentioned, yeah, there's, there's, there have been some evolution since. And I, that's, that's awesome to hear that that's constantly changing, constantly evolving into something that's more applicable and better, especially I could see that being especially useful when you're using data sets. And if the trends wind up going in this direction, as opposed to where we are at, okay, we're going to change. Yeah. There's the, um, I mean, the, the, you know, like, like all programs, they evolve with the guy who is teaching them or, or should hopefully. Right. And then, um, as you start to see what, um, what's worked, what's not from a range standpoint. Um, and I mean, I mean like, Hey, how do we get guys to move from A to B more efficiently? How do we build the material? So succinct, um, how do we ensure efficiencies within the, the, the modules, um, you know, are the, are the POIs, you know, constantly cross, cross, cross referencing them with data. And, you know, when I say data driven, I think that people, you know, think that there's some sort of giant, uh, Batman bat computer that we plug into and we just like, you know, and then like we pull out a number and then we live our life by that number. But the reality is, is like, you know, data just helps us ask better questions and, um, data is not a, uh, an altar that we worship, but it's one of those things that is helps us. The larger the data set, the better the product. Um, and law enforcement's one of the few professions still alive that uses the sample size of one, i.e., my personal experience, to then build a program. Personal experience is important, right? I mean, I've got twenty years on. Everyone on this this uh, this um, Zoom call here has has time in LE. Personal experience is important, but I can't build a program off of personal experience. And so when we look at what is the data that is driving centrifuge, I mean, it's it really, I see it as kind of like a, a four-sided box, right? So on one side, you have case law. And that is, you know, I mean, it, it I wouldn't say it's rapidly evolving, but there is very vehicle-centric case law that needs to be considered when pushing out TTPs, especially when we start talking about well, I mean, really any of it, um, but the case law is, is one aspect of it. And then you have your department. So on one, one side of the wall, we have case law on the other side of the wall, we have your department. And so in that department, it, I kind of break it down into two subcategories. You have your SOP. Um, so your SOP may or may not be more stringent than uh, the case law. And in that, you're also going to have the logistics. So what can I logistically do? Um, so a department of 20 is going to be logistically very different than a department of 20,000 yeah. um, and then everything in between. And then what is your, you know, what is your mission set, right? So we do quite a bit of work with the U.S. Marshals. They are more of a pro, they're using VCQB in more of a proactive manner um, than you would see a lot of local departments who are using vehicle CQB in a very reactive manner. Um, so what is the, what is the mission set of that department, the logistics, logistics that are available, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then you have the human performance uh, piece of it, um, understanding, uh, things like, uh, bilateral contraction or, um, you know, how people automate or cognitively process, um, produce automated or cognitive processes, uh, how, how individuals work through open or closed skills environments, um, understanding how people myelinate processes or myelinate information and then give us a result, et cetera. So, you know, there's the human performance component of it. 
And then the last side of that wall is really the context. What are you, what are you using this for? And I think that, um, you know, I think that one of the things that that uh, is very important in our day and age is the is the lens or the context with which we apply force. Um, I mean, it always has been, but it's certainly under a new level of scrutiny these days. And so the context of how do I use vehicle CQB in a traffic stop um, with limited resources versus how am I using vehicle CQB in a vehicle interdiction where I've got 20 dudes, multiple cars, you know, and, and whatnot. Yeah. Planned out of armored vehicles, things like that. So, you know, context is not something that we can necessarily, um, I, I feel, I feel like it's, I feel like it's one of those subjects that's kind of very dismissive in, yeah. um, in social yeah. media settings. But the reality is, is like, you can be dismissive as you want about it, but the dude sitting in a patrol car at two o'clock in the morning with backup, that's 35 minutes that way is like, is not absolved from you saying like, well, context doesn't matter. I mean, it, it, it very much matters to that fucker. So, um, yeah. And so that, that is the somewhere in the middle, right? Somewhere in the a holistic program should account for, um, multiple facets and then build that. Um, and so that's, that's what we're trying to do, um, to build a, yeah, a better mousetrap. Absolutely. I think one of the big, bigger, um, misunderstandings I had was, Taking the class was going to provide me with the solution. No, not at all. Matter of fact, what the class did was it said, here are some circumstances to consider, and here are some applications of some solutions. Ultimately, it's the end user that's going to be using the, the solutions. Not once did Will Petty say, you will stay in the car. You need to stay in the car. You should stay in the car. No, it's, well, take a position of advantage. Where's the advantage? And that's up to the end user to figure out. And if there's if there's material saying where the advantage is, statistically, that's not a bad idea to pay attention to that. And you know what? If the threat happens to be occupying that space, is that the, the answer anymore? Probably not. There's a lot. There's a lot for the end user to have to decipher and apply on their own. Nothing was pr provided to me, at least, that this is it. This is the answer. We're going to put it on the pedestal, and this is we don't need to go to any more classes. No, 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 no. It was a bunch of yeah, variables. The goal, the goal is this, kind of like when we were talking about high-risk stops and I said, hey, we're going to shoot three different common positions for LE yes. in regards to high-risk stops. I'm not going to tell you where you, you need to fight from, um, but I want to show you some numbers and then I want to show you a ballistics demo and then I want to show you some videos. Um, and so after after individuals see the ballistics demo they understand 68 percent of people are winning winning guns fights from the rear of the car um they see the human nature component of that um or the human behavior component of that and then i just i you know i mean you were in class matt i just tell guys like hey listen if you had a gunfight right now like where where would you like to be right so now um and you know the the one of the catalysts or one of the one of the one of the primary reasons that training exists is it should be a catalyst for change, right? Uh, obviously sustainment and there's all these other things, but it should be a catalyst for change. And if you have students who don't have a buy-in and I'm not talking about an emotional buy-in, but a cognitive, like, Hey, this resonates with me. I understand the context. I understand the intent. I understand why this is a better way to solve this problem. Then as guys leave the range deck, you're, you're affecting change. Um, change is not affected in my experience, having been, um, at the Academy for a long time, my, my ex uh, change is not affected by, Hey, do this. Well, why? Because I told you to, yeah. now there's, there's times and places for that. Right. I mean, obviously there's times and, and there's a, there's contextually that is needed. Um, but once you start getting into the later part of the Academy, once you start getting into FTO, once you start getting into in-service, um, giving guys, quality information that resonates with them and then saying like, Hey, here is the information and be an informed consumer. Where do you want to fight from? Or how do you want to solve this problem? That's where we start to see real effective change. And that's, you know, that's where we start really developing people who are thinking um, through the problems versus versus the jump to conclusions, Matt. Right. So law enforcement has been very um, plagued with this kind of this rote. Uh, if A, B, to, if yeah, B, C. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, I think part of that is a byproduct. I think part, when you look at the history of law enforcement, I think part of that is a byproduct of uh, a lot of military training washed over. Right. So yeah. law enforcement. What's the really easy button? 
It, it was. We really took a lot of the training modality that we we got from the military and just kind of plugged it straight into law enforcement, and that worked for a period of time. Um, but I think we've we've evolved beyond that. The other thing about that is is that yes, you're very right, Jared. It's it's one of those. Hey, we've got four hours to get this done. We've got two hours to get this done. We've got eight hours to get this done. Um, and then I think the maybe the tertiary part of that is is that when you look at typical law enforcement instructor coursework like run by the state, it's not, it's not there to explain the why or to create somebody who's, who is cognitively working through a problem for, um, it, it, it's simply, it's simply just like, Hey, this is how the state does it. And this is how you need to pr present it. This is how you need to format it. And, and they need to just get on board. Right. So I think there's a couple of things that, and we're fighting that legacy. Um, the, the trend nationally is changing. So that's a good thing. Um, I think that that as, as a whole, we're getting away from that. You're seeing more questions being asked. You're seeing run, younger range staff or um, range masters. I mean, you know, Andy's a, is a prime example of that, you know, 50 years ago, you'd never see that even hell even 20 years ago. So you're seeing younger range staff that is more open-minded. You're seeing um, more aggressive programs being pushed out. And I would, I would dare say that you're seeing more time spent nationally, more time spent on problem solving these tactical problems than we've traditionally a lot of them, right? Yep. So you have uh, a lot of major agencies that are now allowed allotting eight, 16, 24 hours in the academy or in-service level for just vehicles every year. And, you know, before, at least when I went through in 2003, it was like, Hey man, here's how you get a, a dude's driver's license, registration, insurance. And then, um, and then at the end of the academy, they'd have a dude hop out with a SIM gun and like, you know, you just kind of like, you know, uh, improv it on the fly and, and, uh, uh, and then they sent you out on the, yeah, you're going to do great. Right. Uh, they, you know, you just covered, Hey, just, just dripping in, in FX rounds, right. Just FX, just, just wax, just all over your body. Hey, good job guy. Right. Stay in the fight. Like, you know, so do better. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, we, we have done a really good job with collecting information, but we've done a very poor job of putting that through the sifter and coming up with, um, actionable, logistically feasible, feasible material. Right. So. So for me going through the class from day one to the end, everything had a natural progression. Everything built on itself. Day one, we started with basic shooting drills, did basically the ballistics lab. Um, everything, it made sense because you, we can't talk about using the vehicle for cover. Well, we can, but it's not going to be as effective. Yeah. We can't be talking about that using specific aspects of the vehicle for cover unless we've shown it, unless you've shown it. For me, that that natural progression, that's one of my favorite things in, to see in classes because it makes so much more sense. And people might hear that and go, well, that's dumb. There are classes that aren't taught like that. Yeah, there are. Well, one of the, yeah, one of the things that you'll see is that the whole goal is to be as efficient as possible, right? Meaning yes. that how do I get guys to, to move from A to B as seamlessly as possible? Now, I've run... Um, anyone, anyone who's, who's been a full-time academy coordinator or, and, or, um, you know, worked on the in-service side full-time, you find that you're having to constantly like play the, the game, wh whatever the game is where they switch the, the, yeah. the cups the around cups. they got the ball, you know? Um, and so, you know, I've been at the mercy where, Hey, we can't, we've got to move this, you know, you, the, the schedule, you get, you get screwed up. You're trying to plug stuff in like, listen, man, at, at the end of the day, you can move guys from A to B without it being a smooth transition and or building in a natural formation. Um, but it's jerky, right? It's like, it's like riding in a car with somebody who doesn't know how to do it, man, ha, know how to work through a manual. Right. And so you're just, you know, you're kind of doing one of these or a new driver. Right. And they're constantly like over braking. And so um, I find that the, the more succinct the modules and the uh, more congruent, the, the modality of training, um, the, the more enjoyable the process or the more clear the process is for the student. Not, not that, not saying that, you know, be keeping instructor that week is an enjoyable week. I mean, it's, it's a long week for sure. Right. Yeah. But, um, that it, it just is not like a herky jerky transition from no. one, from one topic to the next, hopefully. 
Well, and I can't speak for the other two or three who have been, who are, who veter, who are veterans of the class. But for me, everything was very smooth. The scheduling was intense. It was five days, minimal breaks. There's no such thing as a lunch break. Personally, for me, I actually enjoy that more. It, it keeps focus better. The closest thing to a break, yeah, we might've had a 15 here or there. Uh, the closest thing to a break would be classroom in the morning or walking from classroom to my vehicle to get my stuff or loading mags. Um, but that kind of goes to one of the drills specifically that seems to be getting a lot of cri uh, criticism and it's about uh, time management. So if we have one person or if we have or two people, students, and there's a aspect of being a police officer where I might be inside of a vehicle. I'm in a vehicle every day, 10 hours a day. Being able to safely manipulate a firearm from within a vehicle is kind of important. That's not every, that's not something everyone gets to do. Shooting from inside a vehicle is not something everyone has ever done. Even in this class that was that uh, you just had, there were still students that had not shot from inside of a vehicle. One so of this, the lead, one yeah. of the lead firearms guy for our agency, we found out he never shot through a windshield. Yeah. And really? I, uh, yeah. I assumed that Phil had, and that's why I bumped him off and got one of the BLM guys. BLM has a federal agency now. I don't know if you guys knew, but Black Lives Matter, huh? <laughs> yeah. So I bumped Phil out and I got one of those guys in so they could play with the windshield and shoot it well. And when it was clean, and Phil was actually mad at me. He's like, I've never done that before. I'm like, motherfucker, you've been doing this for 40 years. You've never shot through a windshield? And he's like, Ugh. And so Phil, that, Phil that bear. blew my mind. Phil's a sweetheart. Well, yeah, there's a you know, lot of, you'll, oh, you'll, which, What's interesting is, so we'll see, we'll see about 1,800 students a year. Um, and which is, which is saying something because we don't run one day classes, right? And we don't really run very many two day classes either. I mean, bulk, a bulk of that is three or, five, or a five day format. Um, so we're booking and out of that sample size, and this is this has been the pace for, for a number of years now, but um, out of that sample size, I'll say probably half um, have never shot live fire around vehicles. And we're talking about, I mean, this is an instructor level class. So you've got dudes that are SWAT dudes, you've got guys that are, you know, run an academy in service, et cetera, you know, all, all backgrounds, um, have never, have never live fired around vehicles. I would say that probably three quarters of the class, if not more, have never live fired low light around vehicles, which is the highest probability engagement. When you look at the VIN diagram, uh, the most common often involved shooting in the U S right now is a low light engagement around a vehicle. Um, and so, and, you know, and I would say probably a quarter to a third of the students who show up have not been through some sort of formalized uh, or structured NLTA force on force in around vehicles. So there's, there's a giant, there's a giant void. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and, and exposure is part of it. Right. So let's talk about, let's talk about fighting from inside the car out. That seems to be, yep. seems to be everyone's and, favorite topic, and it's, right? It's such a small portion of the class but it's getting so yeah much attention. so it takes up yeah so fighting from inside the car out right let's let's first of all establish the need right so yeah. before we talk about the actual drill let's, while let's we were in class need. during that week there was a big video that was shared with everyone yeah 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 there were a couple of videos that came out like um there was that right and and we got a text from um from a student who had actually been through right. uh through uh vehicle seeking instructor and then had to engage somebody from inside a car out, right? So let's talk about this. 37% of officers not responding to a call for service are ambushed while inside their vehicle, right? So 37% is a large enough number for us to say, okay, like, listen, this is occurring at a frequency that we need to address it. Um, so there's a couple of different approaches to that, but let's continue to build the need, right? Um, while there are other areas with higher probability for ambush, there are not, not other areas with higher mortality rates, right? So for example, you have a higher probability of being ambushed while approaching, while making an initial approach to a structure or at the initial threshold, but you have a higher mortality rate inside of a car when we take a look at ambush on law enforcement. Okay? Um, when we also look at the parameters of that engagement, um, the average distance is 16 feet and in, um, with a bulk of those occurring right up on the car, um, which we saw in video format, right? Um, so this is, and this is one of the things that I try to do in the classroom portion is pair the statistics 
yeah. with videos, like saying like, hey, here are the, here's the data, here are the raw numbers, and then I'm going to show you a series of videos that kind of, not kind of, but exemplify the data that we're seeing, right? So a lot of those ambushes are 16 feet and in um, with a bulk of those occurring right up on the car. And the average time frame for that ambush while inside the car is sub five seconds, right? So sub five seconds. Now you'll hear people want to draw a line in the sand and they say, hey, this is, if you get shot inside of a car, this is what needs to happen, right? Um, I prefer to tackle it from a more, again, data-driven um, or pragmatic approach. So understand that you really your three your three main options for being ambushed while inside of a car or being shot at while inside of a vehicle come down to drive away, um, get out, or fight from inside a car out. Right? Um, all of those are viable. One of them is not wrong and one of them is not right. And in fact, we don't push one more than the other. But the reality is, is everyone drove their car to class. So you know how to drive away. Everyone got out of their car to come to the classroom. So everyone knows how to get Andy out. Andy had some problems. I needed to help him get out. Well, listen, the thing about it is, it's like once we got Andy sobered up for class, though, he was all right. And then, um, and then, you know, but, but, but very few people have actually gotten the opportunity to run a gun from inside a car. So this class very much focuses on the things that guys do not know how to do. Um, and what you'll hear, what, and what the, the, what's a very frustrating part about that particular drill is that guys will say, oh man, the car's a coffin. Well, first of all, the car is not a coffin. I'm in the car all the time. You're in a car all the time and we're still alive, right? Um, there are also hundreds, right? Hundreds of officer involved shootings that we're tracking where dudes have successfully fighted from inside the car out. So we know that it works. We know that it can be done and it can be done well and it can be applied within context. Um, so there's no, th this, this whole fear mongering of like, oh, if you do X, Y, Z, you're gonna die. When thousands of officer involved shootings show us like, that's actually not the case, right? Like that's, that's statistically, that's factually, that's factually wrong. And that's the beautiful thing about being, you know, data driven is now it's not like, Hey, I think it's like, Hey man, here's what the data is saying. So let's go work on it. But anyways, um, the trends are the guys are getting ambushed inside the vehicle and they're getting ambushed in it's such a distance and intensity that it leaves us, leaves us with few options. Right? So for example, if I am being ambushed and the ambush is occurring, it's a sliding scale, right? So, and we drew this up in class. Like if I, if I'm being ambushed, and the ambush is occurring at 10 miles out, right? Like 10 miles away, I'm being ambushed. Like, dude, that's time to like, you're like, hey man, like, you know, check check the status of your mags, make sure your dot's good to go, eat a sandwich, you don't wanna be hungry, drink some water. Like, I mean, you know, like get out, stretch, like you don't wanna pull your back. Like there's all kinds of things you can do, right? That now, that now changes the priority, right? That changes the task versus the priority. We now, as that ambush gets closer and closer and closer, and the time, the, the the compression of that time shrinks, and the proximity of the threat now is right up on top of the car, we are left with a series of hard choices. Um, you can get out of the car. That is an option. We looked at videos of that in the classroom. Once somebody prioritizes getting out of the car, they are deprioritizing going to the gun. Um, and we showed videos of guys who were prioritizing getting out of the car and being shot while doing so and, and not surviving that incident. Um, conversely, we showed a bunch of videos where officers are prioritizing the gun within context. I'm not saying the dude's 50 yards out, but the guy's like hey, right up on my car. Um, then going to the gun is, is appropriate. Um, and so when we look at like alphabet soup for for inside the vehicle, which is that drill where I said, you know, two guys and one guy, and then we do it to two dudes inside the vehicle. And we, we shoot a series of targets. That is a drill. It's not a scenario, right? So um, that is that is a mechanism to give guys the time and exposure in a an environment where they can get a high number of reps. So we're not advocating people sit inside the car. Absolutely not. We're not advocating that people stay inside the car when they could get out or drive away. That has never been our, 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 that's never been the case, right? The data does, certainly doesn't show that if somebody's shooting at you from 50 yards away, like dude, get out of the car, drive away, whatever, whatever, and you know, whatever you want to do. Um, I, I, w I would not sit 
I, w- I would not advocate, nor would I personally sit inside the car and sh- try to shoot somebody 50 yards away from from a seated position inside of a vehicle out, right? But the 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 hilarious thing about it is, Matt, is that you know you can line 20 dudes up like we're like we're like we're a civil war reenactment, right? So we're all lined up on cardboard Police targets, court. and we're just like, hey, every time somebody says up, we're we're driving the gun up, we're getting our hits, yada yada yada. No one bats an eye, right? It's like there's there's like that Batman Joker meme in there somewhere, right? It's like no one bats an eye, right? And then all of a sudden, I take those targets and then roll them around a vehicle, right? Bring them in around a car and say like, hey, contextually, this may be a situation where you have to fight fight or 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 go to the gun to to problem solve this environment and everyone loses their mind right um i think i think a lot of it is just the um is the loss of context and and or the understanding um you have individuals who have never done this job um that don't understand the the context of law enforcement you also have individuals who have done this job but are not looking at the data, the national data trend. Well, it's never happened to me or it's never happened to my department. I'm like, well, that's, that's awesome. I love that for you. Right. Like, I mean, that's, that's, yeah, that's ideal. Um, but nationally, this is something that we've got to address. Right. And this is a national level program. So hence, hence the drill. Um, but yeah, we get into, you know, we, we get into how to work the gun from inside the car out for about, for about 20% of the class. Um, so out of, you know, out of five, out of a five day class, we'll spend a day on it. And I think that that is the right for, at least for me, it seems like the right, and you guys can chime in, but it seems like the right balance um, addressing a 37% trend. There's well, one. Oh, fine, Jared, go ahead. Well, the, the one thing I would say is it goes back to what you were talking about on what have people already done? What have people already been exposed to? And we already addressed, well, a lot of guys haven't had that chance. And if that is becoming a real possibility, especially looking at the numbers. And one thing I wanted to bring up, Will, I know a lot of guys get hung up on this. When you reference data, almost all of your data points come from UCR and Leoka, correct? Yeah. So the all of the data is in the is in the is in the Dropbox link. So when we when we talk about data, really it's those four walls, right? So it's like, hey, what is the what is um, what is case law? What is department? What are blah blah blah? But when we when we start talking about, hey, where does that thirty seven percent come from? Well, that was actually an eight eight year study by the DOJ, um, hundred page study by the DOJ, and uh, that came out a couple of years ago where it talks specifically about law enforcement ambushes and where they're occurring. And obviously, vehicles was was vehicle the vehicle portion was. Um, not only of interest to us for what we're doing, but also very alarming. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so all the all the numbers that we're throwing out, unless we're unless we're reference, referencing a specific study, um, the numbers are coming from Leoka and UCR, right? It's all, dude. It is all um, public and it's all publicly accessible, right? Guys are like, man, where are you getting this from? And I'm like, listen, dude, you can use the internet for more than just porn, right? Like, I mean, I have the same, I have the same internet you do, right? So. Mm-hmm. Um, now there are certain, there are certain insights that we've been given working with agencies, like when we set up the program for the FBI and and things like that, where we got tapped into, um, some of the analytics, like the tactical training unit was pulling that, that are readily available if you dig deep enough, but we're just kind of like spoon fed to us. Right. So there's, there's, there's benefits there, but yeah, the, the data, the, the great thing about data is it's, if we're, if we're. If we're if we're talking about the same the same sets as everybody else, then they're publicly available for anybody. It's not like you know, it's not like we've got the this little computer, this Batman computer that that uh, only works for us, right? Right. No, I just I just wanted to bring that up real quick, just because I know there's a lot of guys who get confused by that, and it's it's one of the big problems I think in the law enforcement training world is where a bunch of guys just pull percentages right out of their ass. And mm-hmm. are just making shit up. Like, oh, it's gonna happen in three yards, three seconds, and it's gonna sure. happen. Sure. This. So you just have this issue, and so I really appreciate it in your class that no, we have all the stats, we have all the information. If you want to dig into it and use your powers of autism, you're welcome to. Um, if you don't want to, don't. Um, so it, I, I really liked that. But uh, going back before the tangent. 
Um, Which was a good tangent. <laughs> sorry. I thought we, we just needed to get that out there real quick. I appreciate it. Uh, what were we talking about? Alphabet soup. Right. And so it's, it's all, it's all about what haven't guys done before. If they haven't ever done fired in and around a vehicle, if they haven't ever been a, had that opportunity to really realize that no dude, once you got a duty belt on, once you got kit on and you're in the driver's seat of this Ford Explorer or in our case, a Toyota echo, um, to get your gun out, there are certain moves that you have to do. And if you haven't done that in a practice environment, you might not figure it out in time in real life. If you haven't ever done this in a practice environment, we want you to do it now versus having to figure out and saying, fuck it, we'll do it live. We'd rather you learn it here. Wait a minute. Well, that's the goal of all training, right? I mean, like, hey, we're going to practice putting on a TQ before we actually need to put on a TQ. The thing in about theory, it is, is guys will say, like, oh, well, that's very self-explanatory. I'm like, well, so is putting on a TQ, but guys fuck that up, right? So mm -hmm. here we are. Jared and I were both paired up on purpose. We're both large. We're not small people, and we're in this micro car. Well, the and... problem wasn't that you guys are, are big boned. The problem was all the snacks that you took with you inside the car that was sitting in the center console. There were about <laughs> 27... Delicious. Of the those problem. Well, watching the videos, we thought we were going to be there all day. Uh, yeah, we never been wrong. Never know, right? <laughs> like, hey, there's no way this is going to be like a, you know, a four minute drill. Snacks, 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 yeah. snacks, snacks. Well, the first threat was called at our nine o'clock. Jared spins around, pivots as he should, draws, and starts shooting. And my my hand was stuck between my holster and my gun with him on me. Hmm. That's a good thing to be aware of. Well, but, well, but Matt, wait, you'll never be in a condition. You'll never be in a position where there's going to be another officer in the car. Have you ever trained another officer? How does that work? Yeah. You Have know. you ever picked up a dispatcher during your shift? It happens. No. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are doing y'all. Y'all getting crazy in Utah. I don't know about that. We got it's lots right. of wives here. It's okay. It's true. Um, but yeah, you know, I mean like to, to say, Oh, this, this isn't, this isn't real life. That is, is only, that's only to say, to say, Hey, this isn't real life is indicative of somebody who's not plugged into the national trends. Right. So Bothell, Washington just happened two years ago where uh, an offender walks up on the um, rookies side. It was an ambush on law enforcement. FTO ports a hole through the rookies face, killing the rookie um, to avoid the, the um the ambush right and that's just one of the you know higher profile more recent ones that that's that's happened and, and resulted obviously in that un untimely death of the officer um and so you know the there's the, the thing about it is, is that there's a lot of pe there's a lot of people with a lot of opinions um about how things should be done and the goal or at least one of the intents of saying like hey no we're gonna actually use the data to drive the training is to hopefully remove or, or one of the intents of that is to remove the personal bias right because i mean we're all we're all we're all trying to filter through uh professional bias personal bias survivor but you know all kinds of bias to uh find a solution right especially when there's so much at stake um noise is a great book on bias and the types of bias and how those affect our decision making um a great read but um yeah, that, that is the goal, right? So now it's not just, hey, Will thinks this or Jared says this or Andy, you know, thinks that it would be a good idea X, Y, Z. It's like, hey, this is the 80 percentile. The other thing that I think is misunderstood by um, a lot of individuals and or maybe just not accounted for for those in training is that we're, dude, we're trying to tackle that bell curve, right? We're trying to tackle that 80 percent solution. Um, and that 80 percent solution is just about all we have time to deal with on an in-service or an academy level, right? If yes. I'm given four hours, six hours, eight hours, 16 hours with guys, like I'm trying to, I'm trying to help them navigate or problem solve what is a high frequency, high consequence arena. And for law enforcement, it's exactly that, right? The most common often involved shooting in the U S right now, is a low light engagement around a vehicle while the where the officer sustains some sort of injury and it's conducted with a handgun handheld light, right? Those are national statistics. And you'll have guys say, well, I don't, I think, or I believe, or I don't think. And I'm like, 
the thing about data is it doesn't really give a fuck what you think, right? It does, it does, it just is what it is, man. And so it's my job working for my department and working at the academy and other um other, you know, my my career along the 20 years is to say like, hey, what is a high probability, high consequence arena? And then how do we start to put together drills that that in a compressed amount of time build the proficiency needed to solve this, right? So meaning that the alphabet soup, let's take that drill again, right? So for those of you that don't know, you can Google it. I mean, it's, it's kind of out there, but we have a car uh, and around it is placed a myriad of targets, right? So we do this a couple of different ways now. We'll do a visual stimulus with a laser or we'll call out a letter or number officers orient on whatever the number or later letter or the visual stimulus is. And, and they predictable also. It's yeah. Not one, right. two, three, four, produce... five. It's all over the place. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's, it's representing that sub five second, 16, yeah. sub 16 foot and in category. I mean, I don't have a target, you know, 50 yards off. Oh no. What I'm saying so though is will... the, the targets like, themselves five. are randomly marked. So you can't go, Oh yeah, clearly five is going to be right there. And yeah, one's going to be not right like there. a clock. Yeah. Right. So and so, um, so there's no, you know, there's no succinct order of the, of the target array. And if I, if I call out three or we use a laser pointer to signify like, Hey, the visual stimulus is indicating like that, like it's go time. Right. And that, that is your threat. Um, officer, you know, pick that, they, they look, they figure out where the gun goes, they shift the hips, they, 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 they neutralize that threat. If we were to stop the drill right then and be like, all right, bail out when they bail out and then we reset, it would take forever to do that drill, right? Especially when I've got 20 dudes on the range deck, because that is a, that is one of those, unfortunately, that is one of those drills where there is a little bit of a wait time. There is a little bit of a dead time. I feel like the the ROI is there, but I mean, it's, it's no different than sending guys into a live fire shoot house. Like, dude, you're just like, you can only run so many of the, you only can only run so many students through it at, at a, at a certain amount of time. So keeping them inside the car is prefaced, you know, very, I, I feel like we 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 say it as loudly and like, as clearly as we can. Like, hey, I don't want to be here, but if I've got to be here, like, hey, this is how this works. Um, but the reality is, like, I don't want to, I don't want to do any of it, right? I, like, I don't want to be in any kind of shooting. I don't want to, like, at, at twenty years in, I don't want to be in any kind of use of force. Like, you know <laughs> what I mean? I'm just trying to, like, I'm just trying to vibe, bro. Um, and so we very very clearly delineate, like, hey, we're keeping you inside the car to build the reps. That is no different than everyone standing on the line at 20 yards or going through a USPSA match, right? right? So guys will look at guys will look at the alphabet soup drill for fighting from inside a car out and be like, that's not real life. And then they'll go shoot a USPSA match and not have any problem with it. They're like, yeah, but that's I'm building skills, right? And I'm like, so did you just John Wick this and kill 20 fuckers? Like what? Like yes. What? What what is happening here, right? Like, I mean, like, there's not real life, Jared. I wouldn't be I wouldn't be attacked by 15 dudes at the same time, right? On the course of fire, and, and, and a pussy does this with all the with all the <laughs> dingly dangly parts, right? Um, and so we'll look at that, and we're able to very easily disassociate, like, hey, this is a skill builder, um, and the alphabet soup is simply that, but just in a very confined space, right? So it's also uh, deconfliction. For the individual uh, student. Of, yeah, a lot of, yeah. like, that's the goal, right? Yeah, for sure. You guys also have a different method of using targets as well. Later on, with each vehicle, when I went through, you had three targets per vehicle. And yeah. it wasn't saying that we have three separate attackers. It's it's the same attacker. attacker. They're just moving in a specific direction. And I thought, yeah, like, so I the, really like that. The drill, like how you set up a drill. And these are, the, I mean, these are lessons. And this is the beautiful thing about you know, I never, I never set out to set up centrifuge, right? I never, I never said that in hell, even when I, when I first started off as, as an instructor, I didn't even know like outside courses were a thing. Like I was like, people, people train outside, outside the department. Like what, what the hell they pay for um, that? So that was the, yeah, that was like, I was like, what is going on? Right. And, but like, once I started going, I was like, okay, this is like, this, yeah, this is, this is a great supplement to what I'm already getting. But, um, one of the, you know, one of the things with the training, um, having a training background and coming from running at the, and working at the Academy all the way from, Hey, I'm an, I'm a range CF safety officer to now I'm an assistant instructor to now I'm a lead to now I'm like the program manager to now I'm like Academy coordinator to now I'm like, I'm the dude, right. I'm running the Academy. Um, it, uh, it's, 
you're, you're always trying to find little hacks and um, shortcuts that are still del- are still giving you your measurable objectives and still are producing deliverables, but you're trying to do it in such a way that is very efficient and plays into how people learn. And that is uh, why we have the human performance portion in each day of the um, of the five day five day course um, is because, like, due to as instructors, we've done a very poor job understanding what's an automated versus what's a cognitive process and how do we train those differently. Um, understanding what is an open versus a closed skill. You guys experienced that on lateral runs, and as you start to work through this, you understand. Going back to your point, Matt that how the, how the drill is set up is just as important as how the drill is run. Um, and you're trying to find efficiency there. So when you look out and there's four cars on the range, our preface is like, hey, this isn't one rolling gunfight. This isn't a heat reenactment. This is four separate drills, right? Where the vehicles are in different uh, orientations. The three vehicle orientations you're going to see are short axis, long axis, and canted. So we've got the four, we've got four vehicles out there, three different vehicle orientations. And we've got multiple target stands in each vehicle, not replicating the three or four guys are attacking you. It is simply one dude who is mobile, right? So we have a systematic way on how we work a room. That systematic way applies to vehicles. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check the inside of the car. Um, all I'm looking for are if there are innocent people, I need to go find somewhere else to gunfight from or work from. If there are um, if there are offenders in there, then I need to address that, whatever that that threat scale is, that use of force scale is. And then we're going to work that uh, from near to far, um, playing into that that visual that visual process. Like so, from a CQB standpoint, like you don't look three rooms deep. Like you're, you're responsible for clearing your area first, and then working working out. So there's a, there's a lot of um, you know we didn't pick vehicle CQB by by rando. There was a there was a lot of um, intentional piggybacking off of hey, this is what we do on structures, so now we're just going to apply this to cars, right? And I think some people have umbrage with that. I, I mean, I know I know the vehicle is a vehicle. I know it's, I know it's not a room. But what I have found um, working with, you know, every spectrum of I've got dudes that are really high speed all the way down to guys that know all the different flavors of window and everywhere in between, like I've got to get all of those dudes through in service. One of the things that I've found that it's like a kind of a hack, if you will, an instructor hack, is that if I take a new concept or idea and I piggyback it off of something that, or I piggyback it off of a pattern or a schema or a blueprint that you're already familiar with, then it's much more consumable for individuals. So for example, when we were talking about high-risk stops and I draw out the lines um, and I'm like, hey, this is a center-fed room. And I'm like, would we solve a center-fed room like this? Everyone's like, no, fuck no, we wouldn't do that, right? And I'm like, okay, cool. So let's not do that on vehicles either. And then you continue to draw that center fed room out and you make those, those, those walls cars. Um, and what we find traditionally in law enforcement is that our, that our vehicle tactics and our CQB tactics start doing this. And one of them is wrong. And usually it's our vehicle tactics, right? So. Andy, All right, I'm, are I'm you still alive? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I don't want to do my hands. All right. Yeah, the yeah, I didn't I didn't uh, just kind of take a picture and post myself here, and I'm really somewhere else. <laughs> one thing that uh, one thing that I think is really important with this class, it's not even necessarily the vehicle stuff, but at least for me, and actually also for the other full time SO guy up at our range because we have three, uh, he felt like it was also an instructor development. There was a like, lot of that. Yeah. And uh, one thing I've noticed as we try to improve all of our curriculum, because we do firearms, pistol rifle stuff. Um, I do a, a bunch of taser stuff. And I've seen a lot of this be able to transfer over into our taser training. So, like, if if we're I – I don't know if you guys have done taser training, um, especially, like, annual recertification. Oh, my gosh. Uh, you mean it, it just PowerPoint be... and then you shoot it once? Oh, yeah. Well, if one, once if you're lucky, I think it was twice. That's like the new mandatory. Andy, is it is it more intensive than my online CPR class? Um, I don't, I, they're probably equal. They're probably pretty equal. Uh, but with the, the taser research, you got to shoot two times. 
we've been doing for years, like shooting a static target. And the way VCQB instructor has translated into that is if I set a target up, I have them shoot that one, but I also have like a prone target. So now they've shot, uh, given, you know, verbal commands, shot the uh, standing target. And now I've said, you know, it's ineffective. Now they have to shoot the prone target and they need to use some of the techniques taught in the PowerPoint where they're orienting their taser in a specific way, you know, pinky towards the toes or making sure their, what is it? Red laser is towards the feet, mm -hmm. depending on your device. Like some Sounds of those riveting. things have translated and helped a lot. Yeah, there was a well, there were a lot of uh, behind the scenes things shared that were I, I appreciated them They're really good. If you're going to teach this, pay attention to this, or this is why we're doing what we're doing right here. A lot of whys behind of what's going on with some sneak peeks as to how it's run. Well, yeah, the the other thing too is like when when I so I'll go to three or four classes a year um, as a student, and you know I'm interested in obviously the material. Um, and I'm interested in the delivery. I want to see like the instructor's pace, uh, the the gate of the class, uh, the the layering, the structure, the the you know the how how it's run essentially. But the other thing that I'm very curious about is how did the instructor formulate this opinion? Right? Is it his personal? Is it his personal belief? Is it run off of a data set? Is it how they did this in his agency, his unit, his whatever? Right? Like how did how did he come to this understanding? And um, I tried to make that. I try to make that abundantly clear um, as we work through the five days. So for those that have not been to the class um, and those of you that have, uh, here's here's how the day is, here's how the week is structured, right? So the week is structured in that day one, we give the context and intent for what is fighting around vehicles? What does it look like on a national level? Why do we need to do it? We get into um, the human performance aspect on day one is the, um, the biomechanics like so it takes a 0.5 to make a decision based observation two second draw throw from seated position quarter second splits all that all that good stuff right then we get into positional work and movement on the square range and that is going to set us up for success over the next four days and the reason we do positional work and movement is because traditional law enforcement uh traditional law enforcement movement and positional work is really forcing you to fight on hard mode in and around cars. Like that traditional standing, kneeling and prone that law enforcement does. It's just is, yeah, I mean, you can do it, but you're, you're fighting on hard mode. So we show them like, Hey, this is more congruent for, for athletic engagement around vehicles. Um, then we get into ballistics and the ballistics help, um, help set like a true North for everything that we're going to do. Meaning that if, if, I, I've heard it multiple times where guys will say, hey, the only consistency with vehicle ballistics is inconsistency. And I, I couldn't find that farther from the truth. Because of IHF and NHTSA, the two entities that dictate and spearhead manufacturing standards for U.S. vehicles in on, on the U.S. roadways, we find that, that, uh, that the ballistics or what the kinetic energy that the vehicle can absorb is very consistent. Um, so with that, if I have, if I have the, if, if fecal ballistics are inconsistent, then why even have them out there on the range deck, right? It's like, fuck it. Let's just throw a, a VTAC barricade up and get into some running and gunning. But once we can show that vehicle ballistics are very consistent and there's a reason why 68% of people are winning from the rear of the car, et cetera, et cetera. Once we go through the entire ballistics package, um, that then helps us for the next couple of days, right? Or the next four days. Day two is all fighting from inside the car out. Um, the reason we run that on day two is because the cars are in their best form. Um, so they're as fresh as they're going to be. So we get guys in, inside the car. So we start back in the classroom again, uh, help guys understand the three uh, models of video analysis. So we've got face value. We've got role reversal, which is what we tackle on Tuesday. And then we've got contrast compare, which was what we tackle on Wednesday. Um, we get into... Um, helping people understand why would I want to shoot from inside a car out? When is it, when is it, um, to our advantage? When is it to our disadvantage? What is it? What does the task versus priority look, look like day two? We talk about automated versus cognitive process. And the reason for that is we have automated this workspace that becomes problematic in these compressed environments, such as sitting inside of a vehicle, work in the exterior, et cetera. So we start talking about as instructors, Hey, you need to understand how you're, how you're teaching an automated process versus a cognitive decision are different. And then 
you know, the, the brain isn't one giant toolbox. So we get into fighting from inside the car out. What does that look like? What are the pros? What are the cons? You know, yada, yada, yada. Day three, we start back in the classroom again, get into exterior vehicle work. Um, on that, we start getting into open and closed skills. So what is a closed skill versus what is an open skill? And the real keyword uh, that that we are focused in on is transferability. And transferability looks to articulate what is the what is the connection between the training at hand and the job that's expected? And what we generally tend to find is that people who are practicing a lot of closed skills have very little transferability to an open skills environment. So we talk about that. And the reason for that is because as we get into exterior vehicles, uh, we start off, we start off in a closed skill environment, right? The environment's not changing. And then we very rapidly move you into not very rapidly, but I'm sure it seemed rapid at the time, uh, push you into an open skills environment where the, the environment's ever changing and it becomes, um, uh, a lot of problem solving in a very compressed space. Um, then we get into a late start on day four. So that's day three, exterior week work, day four, late start on day four, start in the classroom again. Um, day four is to tackle injured shooter and low light just because of the frequency of occurrence. So we show what does that look like? The human performance aspects on that are uh, obviously uh, from an injured shooter standpoint, understanding like if, if I can move it, I can use it, right? So giving guys an updated understanding of injured shooter, like we're not like, this isn't 1994, we're not racking it off our shoe, you know, rack it off your shoe, right? Um, <laughs> all the dudes out there with no sags and snag sites can't get a, can't get the side to side, side. I don't know, by the way, whoever thought those were a good idea. Anyways. A sick SAS. Does. No, man, come on, man, dude. Like no snag sites. I'm like, no, I need them to sack because I snag <laughs> because I'm, I'm trying to cycle this bitch right here. Um, yeah. Get into injured shooter and then low light understanding, uh, bilateral contraction, what people think they're going to do in low light, but what actually occurs. Um, and then understanding still in 2020, right. The worst, the lower the light level gets, the closer I need to get. Um, and so we dispel this myth of intermittent light use where I need to turn the light off. Like, dude, that's a really bad idea. Talking about 75% of mistake of fact shootings occur in a reduced light setting. Why is that? Um, so the human performance aspect of it, and I, I will say like for most people, like their only time they'll in their career, they'll ever get the live fire around a vehicle. Low light is, is vehicle CQB, right? So we give them a couple reps on that. Day five is all force on force. Um, of course we do the written, shoot the qual, you know, clean up. Um, and, uh, yeah, man. And so that is in, you know, in, in day five, we talk about uh knit first quadrant of focus. Like, Hey, I need for you to be focused right now on what you're doing internally, externally broad or narrow. So that's the four quadrants. Um, and, and, you know, the thing about it is if you're an instructor and you're listening to this, you're like, man, I don't know what the knit first four quadrants are. I don't really understand the open and closed stuff. I don't really understand system one, system two, like don't, don't feel bad, right? You're not an idiot. It's just like traditional law enforcement, um, instructor programs, whether it's a basic instructor or a firearms instructor, aren't covering the stuff we need to know. Um, mm -hmm. And this is kind of like what Andy was saying. This is stuff that can be applied to any, like I tell guys day one, it's not an instructor class. We're not going to teach you how to teach. We expect you already know how to do that, but it's an instructor level class and that we're going to go over a lot of stuff that hopefully will age you. So I never, I never like slight people like, oh fuck, you didn't know about Nidifer's quadrant of focus, the intentional focus, and how that applies to your when you're when you're helping people on the range. Like, dude, like I mean, I wasn't taught that either, right? So we're we we are stuck in law enforcement and like in this like thing where we're like, oh well, you know, some people are just more visual learners, and I'm like, is it because they have eyes? And well, you know, Sally over here, she's just an auditory learner. And I'm like, let me guess, Sally has ears, right? Like, yeah, like, dude, of course, of course that, right? Like, um, but all excuses. The of the adult learning, right? Yeah, it's like, it's like, oh, well, Bob's just a more tactile learner. And I'm like, because he has skin? Huh. Like, huh. that damn, that's crazy. <laughs> so we do a really poor job at truly understanding or truly, not maybe not even understanding, but truly incorporating what sports science has known for the last 20, 30 years into, hey, how do we modernize um, problem solving with, you know, with with whatever you're trying to do, whether it's taser, taser, you know, live fire shit, low light vehicles, whatever. So there was an aspect that you brought up, especially when we I think it was when we were talking about the different ways of analyzing video and you brought up. 
now I might be combining days, but you brought up something about analyzing gang shootings and how that's showing untrained role reversal. people. Okay. Yeah. Day and, but it's showing, role reversal. Yeah. And it's showing untrained people on how they respond job, and their and their uh, and their survivability. And then we contrast it to law enforcement. And you yeah. talked about something about a mirror and wiping a mirror. And I really, really like that part. Yeah. So I tell guys like uh, data is the looking glass. Right. And so it's very easy for us to look at data sets and or more specifically law enforcement uh, shootings. Um, there's no shortage of them. Right. Um, and be like, oh, well, that guy should have. And then everyone's got an idea of what they should have done. And that's that's fine. I mean, that's, you know, to a point, it can be healthy to a point. It can be unhealthy. Um, but. I tell guys like that is the looking glass in that when, you know, for example, like I woke up this morning, right. Walked in the bathroom and I'm like, I got like shit all like boogers hanging out of my nose and like crusties in my eyes and a zit that needs to be popped. And like, just like all kinds of like, just, I'm like looking in the mirror and I'm like, fuck man, will you look rough. Right. And then I just start wiping the mirror. Well, no, the mirror is there to tell me what I need to, what I need to fix. Right. And so data and, or large, sets such as officer involved shooting videos, things like that, help us understand what we need to clean up, right? And so currently to date, 54% of officers do not use immediately available cover. And um, I think that numbers, you know, looking at video analysis, I think that that video, that number is as high as 70. Um, I think 54 is a little low, but even still half the time we're not using immediately available cover. So why, why is that, right? It's very easy for us to say, oh, bro, he needs to, you know, he needs to get behind some cover. Well, yeah, no shit, right? But when you look at law enforcement training, we are systemically de-evolving human survival instincts, right? People naturally want to put something yes. between them and the hurt. So we go through a bunch of videos where I show, you know, bad guy on bad guy shootings, right? Um, and uh, dudes with no formalized training and they're dip, dodge, duck, diving, and dodging around the cars, right? They're they're using their, the five Ds of successful gunfighting around vehicles. And, um, you know, with that, it becomes very apparent that, and then I'll contrast that with, with, uh, LA shootings where we're standing out in the middle of nowhere, like it's, you know, the okay corral, right. Tumbleweed slowly goes blowing by and we just stand in the middle of nowhere, right. Gunfight. Like it's the qual line. Mm -hmm. And, and guys, and, and, you know, instructors will look at that all horrified. And I'm like, dude, like that's our mirror. We created that. We created that because, you know, by and large, 99% of law enforcement training is standing out in the middle of nowhere with a full value target uh, using nothing but air to get hits on paper. And we're seeing the negative effects of that type of training um, in actual real world engagements, right? And so, you know, I, you know, large data sets is, is experience, right? We're pulling in collectively as a profession to say like, hey man, you know, we're seeing this happen hundreds, if not thousands of times a year. Um, and this is this is where we're doing well. And this is where we're, we're having a problem. And so um, I, I, I don't think, you know, you don't have to pick one or the other, right? You can be, you can have experience um, within your profession, within your given, your given field. And you can also use large data sets to help ask better questions. And then coming kind of coming back full circle to that, right? Um, I, I heard this quote one time, um, data helps us ask better questions, right? It's not the solution. Data just helps us ask better questions. Um, the, another, another Harvard professor went on to say, um, that data that wins and losses leave behind clues. If we're smart enough to ple ple uh, to put them together. And I don't have, I've got, I've got his name written down. I don't have the, the professor's name off the top of my head memorized, but I thought that was interesting because, you know, the wins and losses leave behind clues. And so if we're not learning from those and trying to amalgamate those into our program, then man, we are, you know, mama bird, baby bird, right? I throw up in your mouth and you grow up and you throw up in his mouth and he goes up, those in his mouth and we're just all repeating the same, the same, um, the same problem is it's like the whole engine block thing, right? Like I was like, ah, oh, get to the engine block. You, you can say it as loud as you want on Instagram, right? I mean, you can believe it as hard as hard as hard as you want in your heart. You can, um, you can, uh, you know, you can in your heart believe that that's the best. That's the that's the best response. I'm gonna tell you this: that's not where people are winning from. 
right? And that's just a data set. Like that's not a data set well made up, right? That's just hard data where it shows like, hey man, people are winning more long axis rear of the vehicle than the front. Now, may you have to fight off the engine block? Yeah, man. May you have to use a wheel assembly? Yeah, may, maybe that's all you've got? Sure. But if the car is your canvas, right? And you're about to paint your your Mona Lisa, right? Your, or your Jason, your, your Pollock painting or whatever, like, um, you're about to go any full Andy Warhol on this canvas, like, dude, there, there's a better place to start from. Right. And so what we're trying to do is we're just trying to stack as many odds in our favor. And that's the goal. You can stack all the odds you want to in your favor and still lose. Right. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to take all of the known quantifiable benefits and the percentiles that leverage this environment in my favor and then stack those against the other person. That's all a tactile advantage is. When we talk about what is a tactile advantage, tactile advantage is when I take something with a known percentile and put it in my favor, all right? That's why we dump two dudes in a room because most of the time, two dudes, are, are it's, it's easier to fight, you know, uh, uh, it's harder to fight two dudes than it is one guy, right? So, um, and we just keep building off of that. But, you know, to, to date, um, I will say this, like we're, we're very fortunate in that we, uh, the program, the VCB instructor program is now 10 years old this year. Um, and we've, uh, I guess Pat was 116. We just had another one. So 117, 117 people who have specifically been to Vigil CQB instructor, VCB instructor, and, um, and one specifically in around cars right now, not students of programs that they pushed out, not guys that, I mean, those that's in the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. But I'm talking about guys that have specifically been to um, our class and then been involved in engagement in around a car. We're batting a thousand. Um, I also am not aware of any 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 student who's been to an end user class and then and then not been successful around the cars. Not that there's magic, right? It's it, we try to do everything farthest from that, where it's like, hey, this is it's data. It's just it's just numbers, right? And we're trying to leverage those numbers in the best way possible. Um, and we're, we're batting a thousand right now. It's not, it's not magic, right? Like it's not Harry Potter incantation. So, um, you know, you can be in the wrong place at the wrong time, or you can be in the right place at the right time and still take a round. Right. But, uh, we're, we're batting a thousand. We're thankful for that. And I think that it is because the, the guys over, at, uh, you know, myself and, and the guys, at the, the other instructors at center future are doing their due diligence to say like, Hey, this is, this is what's working and this is what's not in real time. And then how do we incorporate that into, TTPs and drill format. I think there's something that I heard one of the students say a couple of weeks ago, and it kind of reinforced hurt. a lot of this. What was that? My knees hurt. There's that too. <laughs> um, no, it, they were saying something about how it felt weird to take cover and shoot from behind cover. And that's a reality, especially with what's, how things are being taught. How often do officers get familiar and get comfortable with that? This is why we're seeing the shootings, as you just said. It's not that the officers aren't trying, and this is something you say in class. It's not that they're bad cops or they're bad people. These are the results of what the training has been. And hopefully, sure. through the, a class like this, that can change. 100%. 100%. Well, I've got um, any any final any final questions. I've got uh, dinner um, to grab. Yes. And uh, yeah, man. So what, like, uh, what thoughts, questions, uh, things that, that people want to know? Uh, we've got a few minutes. Anything you want to bring up? So Eric says no. Jared? Oh, is Eric Galhas on here? Yeah, he's hiding. He's, he's mute. Oh my God, dude. I hate, are you logged in through your MySpace or what is going on? Here, man? <laughs> okay. okay. Red shirt, right? Not everybody who's older than you had bad ideas. Some of us were pushing stuff back in the early nineties and fought the fights that teed up some of the youngster successes today. I just, I'm just amazed that Eric's still alive. Honestly, the last time I saw him in class, I was like, man, I'm just so glad I get to share the range with this man because it ain't going to be much longer now. Oh, but thanks. Here you are, still, still, you're still in your glory. Hey, you know, Eric gives me hope that when I am old and decrepit, and like in my winter years, and don't really have a lot to look forward to or a lot of life left to live, that I'll still be out there on the range and and fighting the good fight. But uh, no, Eric, Eric, Eric actually, shout out to Eric. Uh, he actually uh, wrote a, a white paper on passenger side approaches 
that uh, we use, we reference, we use. Um, I mean, obviously, I took his name off of it, and and I put I put mine on there. I mean, you know, but uh, no, uh, obviously, with his with his with his permission, with his permission, that's in the Dropbox link, and so um, he has been um, a proponent of very progressive eagle based tactics and and uh, law enforcement problem solving for a number of years. So it's good to see you, man. Thanks. Nice to, nice to be here for a minute or two. Andy, anything? Enjoy it because you got it much longer, bro. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't, I can't think of anything specific. Will, Will said a lot. Um, yeah. It's, I feel like we almost did the class again in this 90 minutes. Do you, do you, are you like, do you need like a, um, uh, an instructor research? Uh, <laughs> do you want me to mail you one over? <laughs> No, I've just been sitting here listening, and my pants just ripped again already. Again, <laughs> listening. So we need oh, to no. talk about mantle. <laughs> everything. Oh my everything hurts. Oh, my you know, I um, did you hey did you send those a uh, man? Totally side note. Did you send those pants back to Kate or no? Yeah, the I did. Uh, did. She they sent the uh, mod threes over, dude. The mod threes are nice. Yeah, I know. I I, you, I, I like those. the mod um, threes a lot, and they come. Yeah, in so the, I've never I've never seen oh, um, the mod ones rip like that. So that's obviously some sort of defect. Like, I mean, I, I, if they rip like that, I would tell you, I'd be like, yeah, I mean, that's a problem. But um, uh, yeah, so I'll I don't know. I'll take a look at them whenever we get back up to St. Louis. But uh, the um, the mantle stuff is uh, coming along, right? Uh, if you really like Navy, I've got a set of clothes for you. <laughs> if you and the thing about it is, people are like, but will uh, I want the stuff in? You know, well, yeah. I want the stuff in Nutella Brown, right? Yeah. And I'm like, well, listen, through Jesus and a can of spray paint, all things are possible. So uh, get the step, and I guess I don't know what to tell you. Bust out that rit dye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I'm glad you I'm glad you enjoyed the mod threes, man. No, I I, I I really like them. I um I've been on the quest to find the best range pants, and I finally honestly these mantles, the mod threes I like more. There's no S, it's just mantle, mantle. Uh, <laughs> the the mantle mod threes I like more than the cry. Uh, I have some G four shell field pants okay. so they're new news and they're 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 good i like them a lot but the pocket configure configuration on the g4s just really isn't great and if you put anything in the pockets of the g4s it rattles against your leg and it hurt it's just not comfortable and I, and you know just... what i i grew up wearing cries just like everybody else and i love mm -hmm. them um i've i in fact I, I think i was wearing a set um uh on the range uh when we were up there in, in uh, Salt Lake city but mm -hmm. the um the pocket configuration, like, bro, who the yeah. fuck is designing that shit? Like, where, like, what kind of arm, yeah. what kind of arm <laughs> configure, like, who, like, you're like, okay, I, it's time to get my thing out of my pocket, right? And you're like, what the hell is going on here, man? Yeah, uh, like, it was, it's like, not. Pockets are a pain in the ass, don't get me wrong. Like, just getting, doing pocket placement is, is, is problematic because everyone's got a different body style, size, mm. size, style, but, uh, Man, it's like it's like cry didn't even try. It's like, hey, we got Johnny the blind forklift fucking driver over here. He's gonna figure out where the pockets need to go. Great, great company, good product, you know, great pants, but man, what the hell is up with the pocket layout? Anyways, that's my tire. Hey, so hence mantle. The man the mantle pants are great. That that's all good, I'm saying. The good, pocket configuration the mod the mod threes are absolutely fantastic. I think the issue with the mod ones was they were short on me. And so I think my knee was hitting at a weirder location because yeah, I'm, I'm, you're, I'm a taller six? guy. I'm six, two, six, three. Yeah. And so I was high watering those mod ones a little bit. And I think yeah. Cause happened. we only made them, we only made them in 32. Yep. Right? right. So if you need a 34, then I, I got no, I got nothing for you, man. I guess you can <laughs> buy two and sew them together. I don't know. Right. That's, <laughs> that's the struggle of the small I just business. Just need an extra you know? inch. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, hey, don't we all, brother? Don't we all? Don't we all? Uh, oh, yeah, man. Uh, check out uh, check out Mantle Clothing if you get a chance. Uh, we've got the new Mod 3 stuff, and it's reasonably priced. Um, so the tops, I think, oh, are yeah. retail for 75 and the pants are 150 I believe. I'd have to check. Um, but um, I feel like I feel like where – the material, the construction, and kind of like where they're falling in the in the in the the landscape, they're underpriced for for what the competition is. So, yeah, yeah, 
no, I would say these, these are direct competitors to the cry gen four shell pants, like the material, the options, like what, what this is. And, but those, not, not I, in color. Not Listen, in color. Dude, if you're like, if you've but got price, people, like, I've price got is way better. Weird body style. Like I look like a goddamn fucking Mr. Peanut. Like, and then, <laughs> Hey man, these aren't the pants for you, bro. Like we're trying to, that bell curve, that 80 percentile, that's what we're trying to fix with that. That's what we're trying to hit. Right. Like the most common body types. You know what I mean? If you look like, like, um, I mean, if you look like a cup of pudding, like I, I don't know. What <laughs> it's great. It's good. Well, stuff. So, uh, well, well Matt, if you got to take so off. Much. Oh no. Thanks I, for joining I us. I do. Thank you so much for having me on. I'd Give like us some to, plugs. Uh, Where can people find you? Can, uh, Centerfuse Training uh, on Instagram, back page, and uh, Facebook. And mantles? Uh, same. Same. Mantle with, clothing. With, with an S. Mm -hmm. With no, well, I mean, listen, you, hey, hey, you buy you buy a set, you can call it whatever you want, you're right? You're so, like, these are my man, these are my mantles. These are my, I, my mantles, right? <laughs> I do want to tell you one thing, though, real quick, Will, before you go. Um, Mantle was one of the sponsors for the UPOA match and Kate sent me some free stuff for the match, which was awesome of her. And you kept, it um, on. no, but, uh, yeah, you know, she's like, I want, <laughs> I won that match. And so thank you. These are mine now. Um, more? so the, the, the guy who does my shirts, he just Googles the image a lot of the times to find the logo to put on the back of the shirt. And yeah. so he'd never heard of mantle clothing. And so he did a Google search for mantle clothing and he went to the image shirts first. And let's just say there was a lot of, uh, he saw a lot of penises for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> and he was so confused. He's like, what, what is this company? So he calls me. Maybe, and I'm his, like, no. uh, maybe his browser history was preconditioned. I can't. Ah, uh, for it. sure. For sure. Hard yeah, with hard ones. Listen, I know it's all like weird. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that was yeah, great. no, uh, I, I would, um, I enjoy this. Thank you so much for coming out, Matt. You were a phenomenal oh. student. Thank you so much, Andy, for hosting, um, uh, student like this is a class and two, if you're listening and you're interested in hosting, um, we're booking for 2024, um, classes, we, we stay, we stay very busy, we stay very, very busy and, uh, classes, um, classes fill up pretty quick. So that's, that's rad. Um, but if you're looking to host, uh, on the website, there are a slew of emails, um, to get hold of us and, uh, Jared, it's always great to, um, I guess just support all of your little, uh, side hobbies. Like your, your, I didn't even know we sponsored your shooting match. So you're welcome. <laughs> Thanks. I'm going to talk to Kate about that. Uh, that's probably why I didn't get my pay raise. And, you got another uh, one coming up, so we'll see. Yeah, 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 we'll see. And then, uh, you know, Eric, it's always it's always good to see a friend. It's uh, been too long, man, so I appreciate it. Are you still out in California? You still holding the fort down out there? Uh, no, I'm in the process of leaving the People's Republic. Are you? Where are you going to go to? Uh, somewhere near the Rockies. Come yeah. on, Utah. <laughs> good. Somewhere in the Rockies. He's like, where weed is legal. We Shit. don't want oh, yeah. more Californians here in oh, Utah. He, he, he's you guys have destroyed California. our... They've Jared? destroyed our housing market. Jared, I'm not like other Californians. <laughs> He's not. That's what they all say. <laughs> That's what they all say. There's that Batman voice I'm again. Different. I'm not like well, the other uh, thanks for having me on. Thanks for having me on, Matt. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I'd love to come on again and maybe talk about like not VSKB, but maybe just true instructor modalities. Absolutely. You know, hey, what is it? What does it take to, if you're a new instructor or a younger instructor, what, do, what should you be looking for? Developing what do you need to, what's that? developing a product yeah as in, developing as in the product. course how do you like how do you how do you build something how do you write write material we talked a little bit about that in in you know the material creation and program implementation class that we have but um yeah man and the goal is just for guys to not have to kind of reinvent the wheel yeah. and this is all stuff that is extremely well documented so it's not like oh i've got to go seek out will to understand this all we're doing is just taking widely known sports science and and motor programming and and uh like like very pragmatic approaches to how people learn and process information and then just apply it into hey how does this look at an academy setting how does this look at an in-service setting so uh, i'd be happy to talk about that sometime where you know like i'll give you a, you know i can even provide a reading list like hey this is the stuff that you guys need to need to you know take a look at right so that way you're not 
10, 15 years in your career, you're like, oh, fuck, like, I wish I had known this, right? Um, yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. Awesome. All right. Well, you guys, uh, you guys have a good one. Thank you so much for having me on. I gotta, I gotta get some food. About Sounds good. We'll see you later. Bye. All right. See you. Bye. 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 Now Bye, the rest of you guys are at a crossroads. Do you want to continue or do you want to end? And we can end. That's fine. But if you want to continue, I'm sure we can think of a topic to discuss. Andy doesn't yeah. talk much. I'm going to punch out. I got another meeting to do at eight. Uh, I see how you are. Yep. See ya. Thanks, Eric. Bye, Eric. Bye. Bye, Jared. Do you guys know Eric? I know of Eric through ENS. Okay. But um, I don't know him. Don't worry. You guys will be on the podcast at a later time, and he'll probably be on it. And we'll talk about cop stuff. I'm scared. You should be. You <laughs> should be. You're going to add that to your list of things behind you. Be scared. Oh, the the, the After, list actually goes down and it gets darker and darker and darker. Is scared one goes. of them? No. Oh. There's some murder though down there, I think. Oh, good. Okay. That's a that's Naturally. a good list. <laughs> so then if that's the case, let's get your guys' final thoughts, final plugs. Plug whatever you feel like plugging. Share your thoughts about about the class that ha that we haven't discussed. Andy? Um, I think for, for all the information that is out there on the internet and all of the controversy, I, like people saying context doesn't matter, context does matter. And just in some of the recent chats, people saying things like, uh, well, you know, when you hear someone say, well, shooting is shooting, that was recently brought up uh, and it, it, it's true, but the context of the shooting matters. And so like the context of shooting from inside the car or around the car, it, it all matters. So if you're not really sure what, you know, the context is, Will's trying to pass to you through this, you know, modcast or through videos, man, take the class. How crazy. Uh, some I know sometimes they have open enrollment classes and, you can learn a lot from maybe a one or two day VCQB class as to why they teach what they teach. Uh, and like we hear, you know, people are arguing, uh, maybe calling things stupid, but they've never taken it. It's like, we'll take it. Yeah. And what's in common here is everyone on the panel has taken it. And one thing also that I think that is ignored is when we talk about when we talk about these engagements, whether the officer stays inside the car or they exit the car or whatever, whatever decision they choose, we can't predict where the bad guy is going to be. For me personally, my, my typical unknown is front. I'm doing traffic stop. I have my, my unknown, but is there a pseudo, they're somewhat known they're front of me, but mm -hmm. I can't, I can't predict what angle they're going to be coming from. So if they walk up right to this door, well, I'm probably going to be dis just dead. That's just, that's what's going to happen. How do you, how do you counter that? How do you, your, your, your windows down doing your running radar or whatever, someone approaches from a blind angle and the gun goes right there. Not much you can do, but there are things we can do. We can, we can train, we can take things into consideration. We can practice being as efficient as we can in the space that we work in and knowing what our vehicles are uh, capable of. Yeah. It's all a crapshoot, though. Mm. Well, I would say now you actually have more experience and practice being able to conform to a cover. If you did have someone actually ambush you from an oblique left or an oblique right, yeah. now you're actually able, and you've done it in a training I have an environment. Idea. Yes. Where if you're here and you're getting shots here, you know you can stack that pillar in between you and him. Because pillar yeah. stacking works on the exterior and the interior yeah. of the vehicle. Yeah. If you know you have your bad guy here, you can shift your hips, orient, get the gun out, and start shooting in two or three seconds. Or you can open the door and try to run and get shot. Drive. You can try. I, obviously, you can drive away if that's yeah. if your vehicle is able to. It's all situational dependent. Yes. But I mean, the the biggest thing I would say is uh, I've. I have gone through a lot of our agency shootings 
and seeing how many involve vehicles and it's practically all of them. Yeah. We have a handful of just straight up, you know, the basic bitch open air shot shootings that cops always get. Uh, but the majority of the ones we have are involve cars. I mean, I've had incidents in my life where I actually just went, watched a vehicle pursuit. I have a dash cam footage for that and we're in pursuit and we crack, uh, the, Vehicle one pits the car, it spins out. I move in to uh, get into a box in position, which was a poor choice, but that's what was called for. So I did it. And looking at the timestamp from the 30 mile an hour impact head on collision, from when that happens to me getting out of the car and giving commands, that took approximately four seconds. So if I had, if that bad guy had started shooting at me, it would have taken me four seconds to get out of the car. And that again was a crash with airbags, with seatbelt, with everything going off. And to me, it's interesting to think like, well, what, what would have happened in this situation? What I've shot from inside the car, what I have tried to bail out, get back here. You're what ifing these these situations and you're like, okay, well it took me this long to get out and engage. That's what happened in real life. Luckily, um, he, the guy, the bad guy didn't have a gun. And actually while I was engaging the passenger, the officer who pitted him on bef before was engaging the driver. Um, but it's, it's interesting to look at these incidents of people, you know, or you yourself. And again, just the other, what, Four days ago, I think, on Monday, uh, our agency had a pursuit with a guy who was shooting at an Amazon delivery truck. And they, it was a straight up pursuit and lots of cars, uh, just pedestrian, normal traffic going around. And the suspect vehicle crashes, spins out, and the officer goes to pin the vehicle. And, and when they do that, their door becomes stuck. And yeah. so it's an interesting thing. Cause it's like, Oh, we talked about this. This is now no longer an option. You have to do something different. And so it's fun to see these things in real life and be like, Oh, Hey, I've done this. I know how this works. If this happens to me, I know these are my options. If I get engaged from passenger side, I can bail out and shoot through the car. I know how my ballistics work now. I know how my pillars work for as cover. I know how to stack them. I know how to do this. I know how to do that. Um, it gives you a lot of confidence in your tools. And that's the thing. That's the point. That's the point of the class. It's supposed to give you confidence in your ability versus some guy on the internet showing a video and being like, look how many times you're going to get shot. Look how quick it's going to take you. Look how quick you're going to get out of your car four seconds. Yeah. That's 20 rounds. Okay. How does that help? How does that give me confidence? How does that make the situation better? I don't think it does, but knowing that, okay, well, if I stay in the car, it'll take me two seconds to get the gun out and start engaging and returning fire. And during those two seconds, I can be conforming to cover during those two, two seconds. I can actually be doing something proactively to save my life versus just sitting there and dying and saying, Oh, I can't get out of the car. It, it, it just is this, the whole point of the course, I think is to build that confidence and to help guys win the fight. And that's, yep. that's what I'm about. That's what I like training yeah. uh, officers for. That's what I want to help guys do. I want to help officers learn how to win and not accept those, uh, you know, Kobayashi Maru, no win scenarios. Yeah. Sometimes we all know that happens. Sometimes that's just the way things are. You get dealt a shit hand and that's that. But that should be a mindset check, not a, this is how you train check. And so I really like that about Will's class. Um, being, doing the force on force testing all of it. And that's one of my favorite things about his class is he's not telling you, you have to do it this way or this way or this way. He's telling you, this is the data. This is what it shows. And then we test it in the class. We do force on force and we say, okay, well, if you're this spot and you're in this spot, shoot each other, go, 
who's going to win? Typically the guy in the back wins and you can see it easily when you're back there and you squat down you're like, Oh, wow. I'm at the trunk. I have all this car in between me and the guy up front versus the guy in the front's trying to get down. He's like, Oh my God, what type of mambo shit? And they keep on going lower and lower and lower. And it's, it's an eye opener to say like, well, yeah, this makes total sense. This is the data we've now learned from about the data. And now we're par- participating in the data and we can see like, yeah, it makes sense. This is why we should do this. This is why we should do this. You can't argue that. That's just, it's data, it's numbers, it's facts. I mean, you can say that the data is skewed. You can say that the data is flawed, but I just think that's people being un- uneducated and people being lazy. Sorry. What was the name of the officer who, what was it? He got shot. He pitted the, uh, he pitted the cartel members truck hopped out oh. and was practically ambushed as he was exiting. Bad guy mm-hmm. predicted, yeah, this is the way he's going. Got shot, stayed in the fight. It was it was an awesome video. Mm-hmm. Scanned underneath, jumped up, went around and killed bad guy. You guys had that in the chat, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think Andy I shared it. I can't remember his name, but that so that video is really awesome. And I've shown it a couple of times uh in our uh like pre-service academy or at least our pre-service firearms training. Adrian shows, De La Garza. Yes. And he is, per what Will has said, he is a VCQB graduate. You can kind of see his behavior showing some of that. Uh, and it has like all the food groups of what we learned in that class. We have, you know, injured officer, we have cars, we have, you know, uh, slip tripping, falling, you know, working their way back up. And if you actually watch his attacker, his attacker moves. Uh, he he tries to transition from the back of his truck to the front, and then he gets you know he loses. Colonel, oh, I know he does like the funnest funnest ringtone. It's Metal Gear. Metal Gear. Metal Gear. Wow. Should we all talk like Solid Snake now? Um, Absolutely. David no. Hayter's the, the best. Yes, he is. I don't know. I heard they're making a new one. I hope so. Yeah. I know they're remastering, what, like a handful of them, and that's coming out Three. later, and I'm excited for that. because Was it Snake Eater was coming back out? Yeah. yeah. They're remastering Snake Eater, and Snake Eater's oh, one of my favorites. Dear. It's the best. But yeah, yeah, I just, I, I really like Will's classes. Um, I really yeah. like his, his ideology on training. I really like the fact that basically his whole thing is um, he's trying to revitalize the police training industry because I think so much of in this industry, we have this absolute just shit that gets passed for instructing. We have so many guys that are like, I went to this instructor class. And I got a PowerPoint for 30 days. I'm going to read it to you now. That's right. And you're like, uh, well, do you, you're literally just going to fucking read the PowerPoint verbatim? Yeah. Oh my God. The trigger. The, well, on those classes, those classes, you want to take a one and a half hour lunch because you don't want to go back mm-hmm. versus in a class where you're actually learning. You're like, yeah, let's just eat on keep the fly. On because we're going. actually learning. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. I don't think you probably wanted to take lunch breaks when you went to Darcy. Did you, Matt? Oh, we never did. <laughs> we had to bring that up, right? Yeah. Darcy. <laughs> I have to bring up Darcy at least once. No, actually we did take lunch breaks. We just didn't leave the facility. But, and, and I just, I really liked how his, uh, I, I kind of think his uh, training, I don't want to say it's changed in a way, but I could kind of tell like the first couple of times I've take, I took his class and I talked to him about this was the first couple of times I took his class. It was very much like VCQB was his baby. It was, I am, it was so important to him and it was so important to help change these things in law enforcement, because obviously there were so many things wrong, like doing, doing a uh, felony stops from the V is just it's asking to lose and, and it's something doing... you know, with our within our control well yeah and it's so simple it's such a simple tweak 
but it increases that survivability by so yeah. much. And you're just like, wait, why wouldn't we do this? And so I could tell that that was his baby. That was what he was trying to do. He was trying to change and make policing better, which I really appreciated. And I really liked because there are so many instructors out there that are just regurgitating, taking the the shit that was spit in their mouth and they're spitting it out. And like half the people don't understand what they're teaching with firearms, with whatever. I mean, you have so many instructors, right? Um, there are so many instructors that have zero, zero, zero clue on how to actually shoot or how to actually do this or how to do that or how to do this. And that they're just regurgitating stuff. And, yeah. and I think a lot of it's just, it's the easy button. Nobody wants to make a new training curriculum because it's hard coming up with an actual new training curriculum that is viable, defendable, and able to be pushed out at this national level is infinitely hard. I'm sure I mean, no one's really and from what I've seen since I've been in law enforcement, the only actual institutional change has been pushed by either .gov or, I mean, Petty's really the only one out there really doing a lot of institutional change. And we're seeing it in Utah where, honestly, all the agencies now in my area do vehicle stops, vehicle uh, high-risk felony stops from the back now. Um, we have a ton of agencies that are now pushing vehicle CQB, Utah Post. We finally got them to, they do vehicle CQB now as part of their post curriculum. The one day where they get to go over it and they pull in the chargers into that main bay. And now they're teaching vehicle CQB and it's fantastic. And I'm very, very happy to see that these changes are happening that will help officers live and yeah. help officers survive. Cause I think that's the ultimate goal here is we want the cops to get better. And that's what I want. I'm trying to get cops better. And I do it through a different method. Um, I'm trying to get cops better at shooting. And I do that by introducing um, competitions and USPSA style matches, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's been phenomenal for us because we can, using that metric, we've also noticed there's a lot, there's a significant increase in the skill set of officers all around our valley. And that's a big trickle down effect where once the cool guys and, you know, once the good shooters in your department, because everybody has them, every department has like the two or three gun nuts or whatever that kind of run stuff just because, and then eventually if they start doing something then everybody's like, Oh, he's got S tech pouches. Wow. I want S tech pouches. He's got the good, he's got the good, good. And so you start seeing that slow inertial movement of your training ship correcting and it's it's wonderful to see and um i'm just happy that there there are guys out there and like what eric was saying earlier i mean he's petty's not the only one doing it um there's lots of guys doing it on a small and a local level and the best thing that i can tell you guys is keep up the good fight old people are gonna old and they're gonna try to ruin everything and try to say no to you having an open top magazine pouch and they're just old people are gonna old man wait until they retire or, or until they get fired due to an IA because they tried to bang the new girl cop the dispatcher. They picked up <laughs> the dispatcher. All of them. <laughs> so just keep up the good fight and keep getting, keep getting, keep working and getting better. And I think that's, what's important here, but there's my rant. Oh, that was great. Though. I got to say, one of the things that definitely helped the class, and I didn't know that this was part of it, but it was heavily using coaching and it's coaching from the students and students turning around and teaching their partners. And then that, that wound up, that was a, a dynamic I wasn't expecting and I really liked it. And I think that's something that could make or break the class for some people. If they get someone who is just completely toned out or they're, they're, they're gone. I could see that the class not being as effective for them because they didn't get that good rep. I know when you and I were running uh, rifle and mm -hmm. we, we, we were missing appendages. We wanted more malfunctions because it's yeah, do it again. This is, this is, this not only is it fun, but these are good reps. And we didn't need to get overly stressed about anything or life wasn't ending me doing this. No, was, this is, this is good. Let's keep on, keep this going. And I could see some people just going, okay, once is enough, we're done. Right. 
And then Phil, Phil went and grabbed a different rifle because he didn't want his Colt to get dirty. Well, like, I don't want to step on this. And I'm here I take my Hodge and throw it. <laughs> <laughs> it bounces on pavement. It's okay. That's yeah, fine. That's okay. You can always just get a Sharpie and color fill that thing, right? Perfect. Boom. Perfect. I thought that's how they paint the whole thing. It's yes, it's all just Sharpie. Okay, good. That yeah. was right. For Hodges, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Colts are better than Hodges. Yeah. Clearly. Ooh, clearly. At least where we're from. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they have a contract. Oh, yeah. That well, means actually, they're better. I understand Psionics has been picking up some contracts. Mm, no. <laughs> and up in my area they have. Well, there 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 there's a kind of cool I, I i actually noticed that there's a handful of agencies in our area that are starting to go for more gucci builds and there's one agency they just traded out their hk 416s for uh triarchs and that mm. was a funny but uh they're they're happy with it and yeah there's actually a number number of county number of cities now that are using small local builders who are just yeah sourcing their own stuff and being like, yeah, yeah we can build you in a, we can build you a duty grade AR for like 800 bucks. And so they're like, yeah, we're going to go with that because we can't even get Colt to answer the phone. We can't get FN to answer the phone. And then the FNs we do get all break. So it's like, great. F and FNs. Dude, we've had some potato ass shit from our FNs. That's all I'm saying. Yours seemed it's okay. A, mine uh, appears to be an exception. I think we got 20 new rifles. Of a lem lemon. Yeah. The, we got 20 new rifles from FN and I believe, uh, how many have gone down Andy? Like 10. It's um, been rough. I think that's like the minimum that have gone down. <laughs> it's, it's been, it's been really rough. Well, take uh, them apart and put, put, put them back together with the good parts and they'll be fine. Take it. Take what, crappy lower here, crappy uh, upper there, throw them away. That's what they're trying to do. And it's just, we're having, we have very much an old guy mentality for a lot of our range stuff. And so like, you can't, you can't change anything. You can't, no, 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 no. It has to be factory. You can't swap uppers. That's, that's inconceivable for ARs. You can't do that. So it's, it's, it's been rough. And so I, I think in another agency, they, these issues wouldn't be nearly as a, problematic because you could just be like oh we'll just part 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 done fixed yeah. but our our specific agency is a uh, kind of doing the dog butt scoot around in a circle with these fns because they just don't know how to <laughs> they don't know what to do and they're panicking well you guys also are gonna <laughs> run into a huge big change is it next year yeah yep it's, it's gonna be a big change but Hopefully we're going to use that as a leaping point into yeah. the future and we'll see. We'll see what happens. This is cryptic for you listeners that don't know what we're talking about. We're just, my, my current agency is kind of being split in a way. And so the divorce is going to happen next year and there's going to be some. Who's the mom and the dad? There are answers to this that I will tell you offline. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say, well, the dad is the sheriff's office and the mom is all the individual uh, little cities. Yeah. Who gets custody? That's what I really want to know. Yeah. Well, who's getting the toys? Who's getting the fun stuff? Who's getting the house? Who's, who's getting, getting the range? Car? I know. Oh, yeah. So it's, it's, I like that range. It's a, there, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of good stuff going on and we're very optimistic for how things in the future are going to go. But what's crazy is like it could really open the door for both agencies to like, like you said, you're just like grow suddenly, mm -hmm. like uh, policy changes possibly, or, you know, improved equipment, there. improved mindsets. Yeah. All that well, we were stuff. we were talking to the uh, to some of the officers today, and it's like, dude, we could. There's all sorts of stuff we could implement. There, we could implement a PT test because right now our department doesn't have a PT test. Unless the only time you do have to do a PT SWAT? is once you get hired. Oh, uh, SWAT has an obstacle course PT test, and that's actually a very reasonable thing and very passable, very doable for any officer. It's more of a, uh, let's call it a skills and abilities test. It's like you have to run carrying, you know, 60 pounds for a hundred yards and you have to 
climb over a fence. Then you have to crawl through a tunnel. Then you have to climb up a ladder. Then you have to climb over a traffic barricade. Then you have to do this. Then you have to do this. Then you have to climb through a window. It's all very basic stuff, but it's also stuff that you can think of multiple people in the agency that would not be able to do that. And honestly, those people probably shouldn't be cops. If you can't do, if you can't climb over a basic bitch chain link fence, maybe you should start getting that shot into your stomach and lose some weight like everybody's doing. Shot Have you not heard of that? Oh, that's what all the cool kids are doing now. It's some, uh, uh, what's it called? Diabetes medicine. That the <laughs> side effect, the side effect is you actually just lose weight because it curbs your appetite. Oh. And so now all the people in Hollywood and all these, uh, there's a lot of, probably getting passed around the dispatch center of people <laughs> getting these uh diabetes shots and it helps them lose weight and it's it's wild there's been a handful of uh detectives because of course they're detectives um who have lost a significant amount of weight using using this new shot and it's it's you cool you don't need to lose weight, weight. I, I do Okay. I need to. Everyone, everyone needs to really, Matt. Oh, I do. I absolutely accept that. <laughs> everyone, everyone could get a little bit skinnier. Um, but yeah, it's it's an interesting world. That. Yeah, there's there's a bunch of them now, and they're they're all over on the Instagram feeds and the Facebooks. Yeah, for now, until there's actual side effects that kill side you effects. or side you... effects aren't a thing anymore we don't care about that uh, follow the science matt that's true <laughs> i'm looking at the bell curve here <laughs> exactly so do you guys have anything else regarding v cqb because i'll s we'll end it here shortly i'll do my final little stuff any final plugs that anyone has not brought up where you want additional um, followers, YouTube or the, Instagram or the Twitters. The main the, thing I would say. The mantles. What? Yeah, the mantles. If you could take this, if you could take VCQB, if you have the a chance and the ability to take VCQB, I would 100% recommend it. I would 100% say, dude, if you're going to pay for a class out of your own pocket, this is the one to do it because it's 100% worth it. And it is absolutely a fun time. And uh, you will get way more out of this class. If you're a cop, again, because this is a cop's class. If you're not a cop, don't fucking take the class because it's not for you. I, I, I'm i like, you'll still get stuff out of it if you aren't a cop. It's not focused but, on your demographic, though. But yeah, it's, this, is, this is all about law enforcement engagements around vehicles in the United States. Those are all important words. All of those words are this class, not law enforcement engagements in Britain. What about Canada? Well, Canada, maybe they are. Cause they do have a Canada. That's true. Outlet. No, something. So, so I would highly recommend the class. Um, I say absolutely. You should take it. And um, if you're interested in, talking to me or want to follow me. I don't know. This is all weird crap to me. Still. I am on Instagram and Facebook. I have a company called waypoint training and Instagram is just at waypoint training. Facebook's the same thing. Waypoint training. Uh, feel free to give me a follow, send me a message. Tell me I look stupid. Tell me you like my sign. I don't know, whatever you want. Um, or if you're interested in learning more how to help cops get more involved in a uh, competition shooting, that's kind of my little niche right now. Is that's I'm very, very good at that. And we built up that uh, UPOA match from maybe 100 cops attending. And now we're at 250 cops attending. And that's at the handgun match. The rifle match is coming up here in October, I think. And that's going to be probably 150 cops. And it's just, it's a lot of fun. It's a good time. So thanks. Andy, anything? Um, yes. Take BCQB. 
Um, Centrifuge has other classes that are not just kind of plug them only, but they have other classes, and you can see the bleed over between, like, maybe low-light handgun. Take that. that. Like, that can be, you know, applicable uh, to anybody. Uh, mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, I do have an Instagram. I'm not trying to make, get a lot of followers. Uh, my Instagram handle is, it's, it's kind of, it's very unique. Uh, it's kind of... Uh, We'll cultural. put it in the comments, maybe. There you yeah. go. Yeah, it's, it's hard uh, to it's, spell. It's, yeah, it's almost Hafakasi Wick eighty nine. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a Polynesian thing, uh, but uh, that's why I made it. I, it was for fun. Um, like I, I don't have a um, a training company like Jared. I do have a very like, you know, small word of mouth. Like, hey, can you teach my so and so family member to shoot? And so to like make a name for this company, it's called Pragmatic Performance Training. Uh, but I, I don't do anything super big. It's mostly just like, hey, like how do you hold a gun? Or what should I consider when I when I'm shooting? How come I can't hit the paper at the range? It's like very small. So you can find me there. If you find me and you want to follow me, I'll follow you, maybe. Uh, not, <laughs> it's okay too. I got I got blocked by someone that uh, I like an industry person that I I looked up to. I got blocked by him, and I was like, "What? Fuck me! Fuck you!" Oh. <laughs> That's when you know you've made it. Yeah, you start like, getting yeah. blocked by people. Ask Matt about that. Oh no, I, I'm not blocked. <laughs> I'm sure you have blocked many people, and people have blocked you though. Oh no, that silly talk. <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, I'm uh waypoint oh. training, not waypoint shooting. The logo's a like a V and another V. But yeah, waypoint training. No spaces, no underscores, no nothing fancy. So for me, the class uh, yeah, it, it made sense. I, I appreciate it a lot. Um an aspect of it that I also liked that will brought up and I'm just going to repeat it is the fact that it is creating content or concepts that uh, are very easily digestible and it can be your in-service training. If necessary, you can take a facet of it and, and drop it into your in-service because typically the in-service is going to be really crappy and it's going to be a PowerPoint. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, we implemented VCQB at our agency over the span of what, Andy, like two, three years. Uh, yeah, it's taken, it's taken, taken a lot of time long to do. Cause we only have like four hours of training yeah. two times in a day. And so it's like little pieces here and there trying to build up. We kind of like almost, we almost have the final product. We just recently did bailout from the seated in the car and uh, a lot of people were like, yo, it makes so much sense why we've been doing all this other indexing the gun, turning the hips and then moving athletically and mm -hmm. then setting our hips and, and all that stuff. So it could take time depending how big your department is. Uh, we've seen our admins, admins have been thumbs upping it as far as I've seen. Uh, <laughs> they say that they like it, especially when you give them context and there's that word again very important well and for me the content was very easy to absorb and then turn around and on a traffic stop you know what i have a, a buddy back me up or i back them up a fender vehicles left hey check this out i this we just went over this in this class i just took very easily to easy to uh to pass on just little mm -hmm. stuff so good stuff well i am going to give my final stuff now so Andy doesn't, so unlike VCQB, interior vehicle work is 20% of the class. Andy has been in his vehicle this entire episode. So I'm alive. I have not. That's true. You're alive. Often, uh, how crazy, right? Yeah. <laughs> so big thanks to the sponsors. Big thanks to Big Tech's Ordnance, Overwatch Precision, Filster, Primary Arms, Walther. Huge thank you to the Patreon subscribers. Patreon subscribers were able to watch this live. They could have chat stuff with us. Matter of fact, they're probably going to get an, they're going to get early access when I edit the video when it is uploaded 
shortly tonight, hopefully. Uh, most likely it'll be released later this week. Actually, no, today's Thursday, isn't it? So I may, it might be released sooner than later. New work schedule. Um, primary and secondary has 736 different Facebook groups focusing on all kinds of different topics. Not really 736, that's closer to like 20. Might be 15 now. Um, also a forum as a backup. Yes, some of these social media platforms are not fans of anything gun. So some, yeah. And so our access or our, yeah, our access to, to new people is being limited. So kind of sucks, but we have these backups. We have the forum that can be used if necessary. But um, if this was educational, if this helped you out, don't hesitate to share, uh, subscribe, it's overdue. We've been at this for over two hours now. Hit a like. Um, let's see here. What else? Yeah, this is going to be on YouTube. Uh, if you're listening, if you're watching on YouTube, this will. This is also on iTunes. So I think that's pretty much it. I do have a bunch of, as per the norm, putting these together is like herding cats. And I have multiple episodes simultaneously just kind of all in this jar. And when they congeal and when I can pull them out of the jar... We, I can create an episode. That sounds gross. <laughs> that's how, uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> um, <Ew>. yeah. <laughs> oh, you have no idea the process to put these things together. <laughs> um, yeah, I can't think of what I have up next, but I know I have a lot of different topics and there are some really old ones that we put on hold and we're like, yeah, well, let's get back to this in a month. And here it is a year later. So, yeah. Such is life. Exactly. Life gets in the way. So if that's all, I hope to uh, get this edited tonight and push it out as soon as possible. Big thanks to the panel. I, I thought it was a great discussion. I really thought it was a good class, and I definitely recommend it. I, I do, do try to do these after I attend a class and, and speak with some of the students and also the instructor to provide a, a better uh, perspective on the class. So that's all. Oh. I think I'm going to, yeah. Oh, sorry. I forgot. Um, oh. One last thing. I also am a um, occasional member of another podcast. Oh, it's called the Paracast. Um, P A R A C A S T. It's not about ghosts. It's uh, parachutes. Uh, <laughs> You're no, all the the, the owner. The owner of the of the podcast he used to do a pay training company called para training and he started the podcast way back then not para ordinance uh but it's a uspsa based podcast where we talk about random stupid stuff and uh basically just it's three or four dudes hassling each other for about an hour or so it's available on spotify itunes all sorts of stuff but uh it's, just, it's another shooting podcast that basically is three or four friends having a good time for about an hour. Or so give that a like and a follow, download it, then delete it, then download it, then delete it. That's right. Get those, <laughs> get those numbers up. And uh, if you're interested in firearms content and dudes talking and making jokes, go check that out. It's a fun time. How much do they discuss Metal Gear? Actually, a bit. Okay, good. Tom, that's what's important. Tom, Tom just got himself a HK 45. And yeah. so we've been, we've been joking about it quite a bit. And I really have a, a stupid desire to buy a Mark 23 and get a fat suppressor on it and just do barrel rolls around and then hide in a cardboard box. Metal gear. locker. One of my favorite real quick cop story because this is directly correlates to what we're talking about. Metal Gear? Yes. One of my favorite stories is we were looking for this guy who just uh, robbed a 7-Eleven. And uh, we're wandering around. We knew he was in the area. We suspected he was anyways, and we couldn't find him. And I'm looking behind this trash area. You got the dumpster and stuff, and there's all these cardboard boxes. And I see this cardboard box. I'm like, no. Yes. So I go and I kick it and it goes, ah, and I just bust it. I fucking, I died. Snake. Laughing. 
and just backed up. I'm like, get out of the fucking box. And he's like, why'd you kick me, man? And I'm like, and so I got on the radio. I'm like, I found him. He's in a cardboard box over here. And it just, it, it was beautiful. I could almost imagine the exclamation point coming right. out of the box. Out of you. <laughs> oh no. Yeah. Out of me. I'm, I'm the guard. Crap. Yeah. <laughs> So I kicked the box and there's actually a human in it and it made me happy. I'm sure the guys in Portland probably have that every day, but it was an, it was a unique, a unique, unique experience for me. So I beautiful story, just kicking a box and finding someone in it. (laughs) Well, your your story just put together two of the concepts we were talking about. We were talking about (laughs) police stuff. We were talking about metal gear. Uh, Like there we go. You never like, People who haven't played Metal Gear probably wouldn't have thought about that. No, <laughs> walk right past him. He would have been. He would have got away. Yes, would have made it. Training. You would have made it. <laughs> that prepared you for real life. <laughs> Otacon. Yes. It's beautiful. <sighs> Thanks for letting me be here and annoy you. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for being on. Don't worry, you guys will be back, whether you like it or not. Maybe I'll get a Metal Gear poster. There you go. Yeah. I'll we'll change see. my green screen. Perfect. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna change my picture to Raiden. Oh, you're all about that fanboy ninja. Yeah, he is. <laughs> what's what's left one? of him? Just just yeah. his brain and part of his face. Is that all that's left? Just mad skills. That was uh. That's probably my favorite. Metal Gear. Uprising. Yeah. And uh, I probably I'm probably the worst. Revengeance. That's that's the one that my kids have watched me play the most. So you're just like cutting robots, cutting people into slices, and they're like, "Whoa!" And you're that's like, oh, crazy. Hey, go in the other room. <laughs> <laughs> Don't look at this. This is Daddy's time. Daddy's video game. Go away. <laughs> oh man! But have you bought any of those swords? Because Jared's going to buy a. Uh... HK 45 or a Mark 23. Mark 23, not a HK 45. The HK yeah, 45 a, is the other better guy. in every single way, <laughs> but that nostalgia factor. Yeah. So there was Big. one at the local gun store and I was looking at going. It's probably like two grand. It was. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why I haven't bought one. Yeah. Too much for nostalgia. Yeah. When I can buy an MP5 cheaper than that, that also fits a lot of nostalgia points. Yes. Well, I'll kill the feed now. <laughs> <laughs> See you guys later. All right. Bye. Thanks, Matt. Bye.